No mai haere mai ki tēnei hui tuatahi um, o tēnei committee, uh, the Climate Action Joint Committee. Welcome everyone to our first uh, hui. Um, could I please um, watu te rākau or we'll pass the, the rākau over to you, Matua Roger, uh, to open with a karaki? Mare. Oh, kei kone a mare. Yeah. <laughs> Matua Roger's um, given you the rākau. Matua mare. Oh, tēnā koe, tēnā koe te pāpā. Ahoi anō, kei no i tātou. Um, e tō mātou mātou i te rangi, kia tapu tō ingoa. Uh, ko tai mai, uh, ko tai mai ngā pōkona pōna ngā kei mui a uh, tātou nei kaupapa. Kia whakamoi miti ana, kia whakawhetai atu e rā te mei ngā mei pai. Uh, kia tutuki, te tutuki ai pai, te tino kaupapa ki a mm. ngā atua, te kauwai runga, te kauwai raro, uh, kei mui a tātou, te rangi nei. Ahoi anō, kia whakahuri ore hia rātou, rātou i roto i te wā kāinga e pā, rātou e māwiwi ana, rātou ngā kui a kau mātua i roto i te wā kāinga. Hoi anō i roto i te matua, te tama, me te wairua tapu āke tonu atu. Amene. Amene. Tēnā koe matua mārei. It is lovely to see you all on our first, uh, for our first hui here, um, and extremely important, particularly in this, in the space that we're in, uh, into recovery and what climate resilience uh, means to us here in the region. Uh, this is a start, it's a journey, uh, we're on this waka together across the region, so thank you all for your contributions and participation into the terms of reference particularly to get us started. Um, so do we have any notice? this morning. Carl, uh, apologies, I have Hayley, uh, Councillor Hayley yes. Brown. Oh, she's arrived. Thanks no. for, for late. Rissin there. She's good. <laughs> Mia Hazelhurst. Mia Hazelhurst. Kia ora. There are no others. Okay, to pai. I'm, I'm happy to move those. Can I please have a seconder for that one? Thank you, uh, Councillor Redstone. All those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Kia ora. Uh, any conflict of interest declarations uh, in today's uh, agenda? Can't apply. There are none. Um, on our agenda, we have uh, Whaka Whanaungatanga, which is really important um, to be able to uh, connect uh, to each other. Uh, ko wai au, ko wai kwe, who am I, who are you? Um, in terms of this committee and moving forward together. Um, so it, it's my pleasure to welcome you all and thank you um, as the Chair of Hawke's Bay Regional Council and as the Terms of Reference uh, state uh, the Chair of this committee. Um, and I'll hand uh, Rako over to my right to Zen um, and the governors in the room to introduce yourself. Um, who are you and who you're representing around the tipu? Kia ora Zen. Right, kia ora Chair. Uh, ko Zan Harding toku inoa. I'm a, uh, a first time councillor for the Hastings Heratonga ward of the regional council. Great grower uh, west of Bridge Park. I sit here today uh, with great hopes, expectations, and uh, not a little trepidation. Uh, this is, in some respects, the biggest job that we have in the region. Uh, I am very uh, ambitious for what we can achieve through uh, working jointly across the region. Uh, it's one of the two core reasons why I ran for council, so I'm honoured to be able to be in a position to to have a role and have some influence in uh, uh, the best possible response uh, for Te Matawa Maui to, to the challenge, the great challenge, the, um, the, the crisis that is climate change. Uh, so I just want to leave you with a uh, uh, thought that I am bring a, a great amount of passion but also in a commitment to being extremely ambitious in our targets and being also very uh, clear and unambiguous about what we try and achieve. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, tēnā koutou, uh, ko Roger Marka tēnē. Uh, my name is Roger Marka and I'm representing the the Nine Marae of Tomatea Central Hawke's Bay and um, echo many of the sentiments that Zan just 
just put before us and more or less a, a watching role at the stage to see what this means mm -hmm. and how it will affect our people and um, the, our whenua and of course our awa and yep. <coughs> kia ora. <coughs> kia ora tato. Um, ko Paul Kelly Takoingo. My name is Paul Kelly. Um, I represent the uh, Kahununu Executive of Waro and uh, Although I re represent Waro at this time, I've been raised in Hastings and Napier and uh, have a sense of history um, for this area. So uh, I, I'm here to help with this uh, catastrophe that's hit us. And uh, going forward, that's my focus. Kia ora. Uh, afternoon, my name's Tim Ake and I'm a third term councillor for Central Hawke's Bay District Council. I've also, um, I was actually born in Napier and lived in Hawke's Bay most of my life been have extensive knowledge around agriculture and now aquaculture. <laughs> Very true, Tim. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, ko Alex Walker tēnei. Uh, ko kora matua te rohi o Tamatia, Central Hawke's Bay. Uh, my name is Alex Walker, <coughs> Mayor of Tamatia, Central Hawke's Bay. I'm um, uh, pleased to be at the table with a, a really interesting group of leaders in the region on this kaupapa. I think it's going to be an interesting journey. Um, and to bring a Central Hawke's Bay perspective uh, about uh, how we take action and how we move forward. And uh, there's certainly, um, as an agriculturally based district, a really interesting narrative about how mitigation and adaptation in a community like ours are actually so intricately linked. Um, but to have the opportunity to unpick that uh, together with the, our colleagues and leaders um, from around the region is actually going to be really, really important uh, for how we uh, take our responsibilities seriously in the actions that we take. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to what I think will be an intellectually challenging um, kaupapa and, uh, and really looking forward to see how we can uh, move that forward together as a region and we have a more, a bigger reason and a more united reason than we have ever had before based on our experiences of the last uh, 14 weeks. So kia ora koutou. Kia ora. Kia ora tātou. Ko Anne Redstone toko um, I'm a Heratonga Ward Councillor for Hastings District Council. This is my third term. I'm also the Chair of Environmental Resilience, Waste Futures and O Maranui Landfill. So this was a natural progression, I hope. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I think the cyclone was devastating, but it's also a huge opportunity to change things and bear in mind what, what has happened to get some resilience in our lives. So kia ora koutou. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, ko Annette Brosnan te kungua, um, ko Ahuriri ho. So my name's Annette and I am from Napier. Um, uh, mihi te Uncle Mare for his um, introduction there, thank you. Um, ko Matahiwi no marae, so thank you. Um, it's nice to be connected. Um, so I'm the Deputy Mayor of Napier City Council. I currently chair our Ahuru Regional Park Joint Committee, which is one of the um, most um, innovative projects we're doing in Napier around our climate resilience. Um, and so there is a natural fit, I think, with this committee. And, um, you know, I think the challenge has been put to us to, to, to make a difference, climate change at pace. Um, and I was reading an article um, that was put out as a challenge to us this morning. And I think, yes, the challenge is pace, but the challenge is um, making a real difference and I think um, what I'm really looking for is that, that tangible change that we can make in this committee. We, we In our roles we quite often sit around tables and we do lots of talking and I think, um, you know, as other speakers have said, there has never been a time when real change and um, real action on the ground is needed. So the opportunity for that in this committee for me is really, really exciting. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to working um, with our partners across Te Matua Maui um, to do that. So kia ora. Kia ora, Annette. <coughs> Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Hayley Brown toko ingoa, um, and I'm also from Napier City Council. Um, I'm a second term councillor and I'm on a couple of regional um, committees with uh, joint mass futures, uh, coastal hazards, and um, the Ahuriri Regional Park. So this also fits quite nicely in with all of the work that um, 
I'm on other committees for. Um, I'm really passionate about us making some headway and showing some leadership around mitigation and adaptation. And um, to borrow a phrase, um, making mokapuna decisions. So mm. decisions that will outlast our leadership and make a difference for future generations. So, kia ora. Kia ora, Hayley. I might go to the screen and then jump back into the room. Um, Tanya Hopmans. Kia ora, Tanya. Atamari, ko Tanya Hopmans, tōku ingoa, ko au te toi hau o Maunga Haruru Tangitū Trust. Nō tāngoi oa hau, ko Haruru te Maunga, ko Tangitū te Moana, ko Ngāti Marangatū he taua te hapu, ko Ngāti Kahanu te iwi. Kia ora everyone, um, my name's Tanya Hopmans, I'm the Chair for Maunga Haruru Tangitū Trust. I've also had the pleasure of serving on the Regional Planning Committee of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council since its inception, and I think that might be coming up to a decade and um, also been on the Hawks, um, the Clifton to Tangoil mm -hmm. Coastal Hazards um, Strategy Joint Committee, which is the longest name in the world. But uh, I totally agree with Hayley. Uh, I think we're all here for our mokopuna and that what we do today and in the days to follow will leave a legacy for them and let's make this a safe enjoyable environment for them which is thriving um so these nothing like a disaster to focus the mind and i think we're all here committed to that so um i'm also a bit of an interloper because i'm not actually formally a member of this committee but hopefully we can speak to membership a little bit later tēnā kia ora tanya kia ora denise kia ora koutou katoa uh ko denise arafira eagleson kari kari tuko ingoa um, ko ngā te kahanunu ki te wairo te iwi, ko ngā te apatū rawa ko kuru pakiaka ngā hapu. Um, I'm Wairo's Deputy Mayor and um, I think I'm Craig's alternate. <laughs> and um, I, I, well, I'm here representing Wairo and making sure we have a regional uh, voice. Looking forward to the co-papa and how we can influence change, at least in our region, um, but also keen to progress flood protection for Wairua. Um, New Zealand as a whole, I don't believe we 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 don't contribute hugely to climate um, to global warming, but I believe that we've got the opportunity to talk to the rest of the world about their contribution. And there's bigger players out there than us, um, and they need to do their part and if this committee has some influence on New Zealand to challenge the bigger players, I'd love to see that. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing um, how we can progress um, a better future for our tamariki uh, mokopono. Kia ora Denise. Uh, kia ora Māre. Okay. O tēnā no tātou katoa, ngā ka tupu wa hau, i raru i te maunga o kahi rānaki, ka tupu te taha o te wai, o tuki tuki i rāua hoki ko ngā ngaru upokororo moko tuararo o ki rangatira, abbreviated ngā ngaru roro aua, um, ko, ko māra i apatu i au, tōku ingoa, uh, he mahi ana me ki te, ta, te taiwhenua heri taunga, so I'm here and, and being the, of course, substitute to both Roger <laughs> and to Paul as the alternate. So um, as we I've just total everything that's been said, you know, and this is a real good time to step back and rethink, rethink things holistically and intergenerationally, you know, and to restore our communities in a way that is more resilient and supports healthy people and ecosystems. Um, I'm here, I guess, as part of the whole, um, you know, um, relationship as your treaty partner and the disproportionate uh, challenges that we face as Māori and, of course, cultural taonga, ancestral whenua, well-being of our whānau and this opportunity to actually rebuild and have that vision that we all know that this is no quick fix and that we're going to not only uh, put in, I think, the appropriate measures of investment into this space, particularly post-emergency, that we're looking into the future without having to go back every time a storm comes up. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mare. Roz. Hmm. 
Hello, sorry, I'm cutting in and out a little bit. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Ros Thomas. I'm a um, first time or newly elected um, councillor on Wairau District Council. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, I've worked alongside the council here for a number of years. And uh, obviously, um, like many others in the room, the, uh, well, everyone here in this room, uh, climate um, action is really important. Um, I think that uh, the East Coast, Hawke's Bay, I think we're in for a lot more hits and more regularly. So I think that um, as a group, you know, to see us work at speed um, and uh, with some really good results would be a great um, outcome of this um, group. Thank you. Kia ora, thanks, Ros. Uh, Di Roadley. Kia ora, Di. Oh, it's Maria from the sunny uh, Rua Katuri, Dai Rodley uh, Tawingawa. I'm Hawke's Bay Regional Councillor for Wairua. Um, lo really love the um, thoughts so far. I'd like to concur with you, Annette, about um, really pushing this committee, <coughs> excuse me, beyond um, beyond the talk and into the action. I love the word action in the title, and really keen to see how we can make some. Um, some action. I um, am representing our farming farming community, and um, I want to make sure that that is embedded in all our kōpapa. Kia ora. Kia ora, Dai. Kia ora. Uh, Tanya Kerr. <laughs> We're getting there, Fana. Kia, <laughs> Kia ora, everybody. Um, I'm up in the hill country, so my internet is uh, so poor that I won't put my face on screen, and I know that I've already cut in and out a few times. Completely support. Uh, the language that has been used so far. I'm here today in Mayor Sandra's um, place and look forward to hearing as the day goes on. Kia ora, lovely to see so many familiar faces. Kia ora, thank you. I might start this side with DZ and then go around the tipu just up the front and then we can crack into the rest of our agenda. Kia ora. Tina Koto Katoa, ko Desiree Kao Toku Ingwa. I'm the Strategy and Governance Manager here at Hawke's Bay Regional Council. And um, yeah, we're just very excited um, to have our first joint committee and to have United Governance um, to give us a strong mandate for our work. So, thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Tom Logan Tokonga. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Canterbury in uh, risk analysis. My specialty is in climate change, and I'm also the technical director of Urban Intelligence, who has been supporting the uh, Council's risk, uh, climate and natural hazard risk assessments today. Hi, ahi ahi, mari e koutou. Nā mihi nui kia koutou, ko Pippa McAlvey Sim, ko tōku ingoa, e mahi ana hau i te kia arohe o te mātua Māui. My name's Pippa, I'm Climate Action Ambassador here at the Regional Council, and I'm really excited to see you all around the table today. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Heather Bossman, tōku ingoa, no ko te rana ahau, uh, kei mariwa ahau e noho ana. Um, I am Senior Policy Analyst in Climate Resilience at Napier City Council. Kia ora. Kia ora. <coughs> Tēnā koutou, uh, ko Taylor tāku ingoa, sorry, <laughs> that's not great. Um, uh, um, I am a uh, Senior Policy Advisor at Hastings District Council, um, and one of the areas that I look after is climate change. Kia ora, thank you. This is our supporting staff that are going to help guide us along the way uh, through our through our um, committee meetings. Tēnā koutou katoa, thank you. Um, we will move on to our decision items. So item number four is the Climate Action Joint Committee Terms of Reference and Membership Confirmation. So Desiree, would you like to lead us on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, firstly, uh, just a, an apology. I think we jumped the gun and in the papers that you received, we did um, have uh, the Regional Planning Committee appointing two members. Um, I think Tanya has already referenced that. Um, so that I think I'll leave that for Tanya to talk to, but um, those members haven't been appointed yet. Um, yeah, and so it's just been a journey uh, getting the terms of reference uh, in front of each of the councils so far. Um, and uh, I think there's in the paper it sort of talks about when they were adopted um, and their appointments made. Um, and there were slight tweaks made, I think, by each council as they heard the, the um, terms of reference, but they're here to be adopted today. And can we fill in the wider district council um, members into this as well? So councillors um, Eagleson Karekare, Mayor Craig, 
And then the alternate is Rose Thomas. Is that correct, Denise? <coughs> yep, just unmute. Killed it. Yes, that's correct, but I, I thought I was the alternate um, for Craig and Rose as a um, member. Okay. We can yeah. correct that. <laughs> Kilda. Thank you. Jerry. Questions? Tim? Um, when St Hawke's Bay Council um, adopted the terms of reference, were you under the impression that at this meeting we would have a chance to have any changes we want to make? Is this going to be now or is this at a later date, later time? Um, were there, when it was presented to your council, were any changes made then? Or no? Uh, so we no. have we have two particular questions okay. um, that we want to put, mm -hmm. uh, and one suggestion. Well, two, one suggestion, but another could lead to a suggestion depending on the answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let's go with the question. <laughs> uh, so the question is um, in the terms of reference. It's um, in paragraph. Uh, hang on, where is it? 2.3. Mm -hmm. um, it talks to uh, the Joint Committee aims to support resilient communities and industries to become resilient to the effects of climate change. And this is the bit I'm interested okay. in thrive within boundaries of our natural environment. Um, I'm just interested in where that wording comes from because if you actually are a well read um, climate change, um, policy analyst that has a particular meaning, so I'm just interested in where that's come from and if it's got a particular purpose. Um, I think that comes from the planetary boundaries notion of um, which we've got a slide later on, um, the nine planetary boundaries that have been identified by Swedish re researchers led by Rockstrom, uh, and we talk about overshooting the planetary boundaries, so what our planet can um, sustain. So that's the reference to the boundaries of the natural environment. I don't know. Yeah, the policy. Uh, yeah, the policy. And, and, and so um, with that, what, how, how is that going to relate from the global planetary boundaries to what we've got to do in Hawke's Bay? Oh, I see. So is your question really around where the boundary is, like whether it's a Hawke's yeah, Bay Yeah, well, how boundary. it's going to be relevant to what we need to do in Hawke's Bay. So are we, are we approaching this from a global climate change boundary perspective or are we approaching it from a Hawke's Bay perspective? So it would definitely be a Hawke's Bay, uh, and the short answer is a Hawke's Bay focused um, actions, certainly in our emissions reduction plan, but I think it speaks to the general notion of living within the planet's um, capacity. capacity. Okay, so um, so the work that that planetary boundaries work has come from actually is a framework that actually has specifics written behind it in the framework about trade-offs and in, in climate policy between environmental outcomes for different sectors and different land uses. So it feels like a benign description to have in a terms of reference. But I'm just interested in how much of then the framework and a massive body of work that sits behind that that the executive are going to try and put into our work. So could you direct us, so if we're comfortable with the planetary comment there, it's about where do we see the regional specific boundaries and framework within the rest of the terms of reference? Mm, I think those regional boundaries have to apply to our actions, yeah. but yeah. obviously we're influenced by a global, um, you know, the, the planetary boundaries are much wider than Hawke's Bay, even nation, their national considerations. So regional for our actions, but we well, we say we um, global warming is caused globally, but we feel the impact locally. So I don't, know. I don't think there was any intention to reference the broader that piece of work that you are okay. mentioning. So if okay. that is confusing, we can yeah, take we can it out. Move the second okay. Well, as long as it's kind of noted that that is the clarification of that definition, I, like it's a a nice description of us trying to live within our means, mm. but it actually in climate change science has a whole other <coughs> world of meaning behind it. So just being clear that it means what we think it is, which is the environmental boundaries of what we have around us in Hawke's Bay, and it's not referencing a, a whole wider framework that we haven't really, really understood. So as long as we understand that, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Another. another question? You're going to do the next one. Oh, yeah, the second one um, was, the second one was, uh, that uh, in terms of the purpose of the committee and the strategy work we're going to put together, how how it aligns with um, the 
a UN Paris Accord, because actually there's some descriptions in there that, that are quite helpful in terms of describing what it is we're trying to do. And the bit that I'm particularly, that Central Hawke's Bay is particularly interested in is, um, and I don't, it's easy to take it out of context, um, but I think when I say it, you'll understand what I mean. So there's a whole article too, which talks about what the Paris Accord is trying to achieve, and has a particular description about what that means for food production. And when I think about this from a perspective of Hawke's Bay and what Hawke's Bay is now and what Hawke's Bay uh, is going to be in the future, there's always going to be a food production component to that and wondering whether we should consider um, at least part, if not all, of um, some of the description of what the Paris Accord uh, has when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And had that been considered? No, it wasn't considered to put um, the specifics of the Paris Agreement. We can work something in there about food production, food security. Is that what the kind of things you're referring to? Food security? Uh, yes. And so even if it was in Purpose 2.3, that it could include um, the wording that uh, increasing the ability to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change um, in a manner that does not threaten food production would be a helpful reference to the Paris Accord and give some context that's relevant to Hawke's Bay. <coughs> Is there a separate section to the terms of reference that includes um, all the reviews, reports, agreements? No, like the legislative context? Yeah. Uh, no, there's not, but that, if that was useful, we can put that in things which we're going to speak about. <coughs> Act and our nationally declared contributions, those kind of things could be in an appendix here. An appendix? Would you be satisfied to refer to those pieces of legislation given we don't want to, I suppose, list them all in, in, the, in the purpose, knowing that we all probably agree that we could support um, those legislative documents? So I think um, p potentially connected to the background that's attached to the terms of reference, yeah. that could possibly be helpful. But yeah. but also just flagging, like, it's the kind of, to be able to move forward, we're going to have to get really clear on what it is we're collectively trying to achieve, what the outcomes we need to get to. And if we don't have a common view of that from the beginning, what's going to happen is we're going to talk all lots of nice, really good mm -hmm. stuff, and then we get down to the actual actions, and we're going to go, whoa, we're actually poles apart here because we haven't describe what success looks like. Um, and success from, from, from our perspectives of that we are clear about that, we're going to have a conversation about the role of Hawke's Bay and climate action connected to food production and how we live and how we work and all of those things together and just not to decouple decouple that. Um, so yes, we could reference it in the, the project background, but it is quite important to give us a common ground of where we're starting from. Mm -hmm. Sam? Oh, thank you, Chair. Look, I just want to sort of put the point of view that um, in talking about um, not threatening food production, I don't think we want this committee to get in a position of defending or shoring up individual production systems. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be open-minded and, and flexible about what the future of of the agricultural production and the horticultural production of, of Hawke's Bay looks like. But, I mean, I completely agree with mm -hmm. Mia Walker that, that our, you know, our future is is inextricably linking. I mean, we are the productive heart. Of this, you know, the biggest, if not the, mm -hmm. the second biggest, you know, productive heart of this country, and, and that's not going to change. And we're, nothing that we do here will, will be trying to do that. Um, but that's not to say that what's grown in the current place will be the same thing that's grown in 50 years' time or even 20 years' time. But we 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 want to see a more productive and more resilient um, agricultural mm -hmm. community. Yep. Could we have those noted to be, um, I suppose, documents to be able to go back to? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Would appreciate that. Kilda. Uh, any other questions in terms of the terms of, for this item, terms of reference membership confirmation? Oh. Um, yes, Annette. Uh, just a question around the membership. So there, um, there is the, I think, I don't have the wording directly in front of me, around the membership of the Tai Whenua from Natika Hanunu. However, yes. we don't have members from Te Whanganui Aroto yes. here. Is that, have we made the invitation for delegates and they haven't been, those spots haven't been filled yet? 
Um, no. So through the Māori Committee, there were two places made available. And on the Māori Committee are uh, four tai whenua and three representatives from each of those tai whenua. Um, and it was resolved at the Māori Committee two weeks ago um, to have representatives uh, Dr Roger Marker and, and Paul Kelly as those two representatives from the Māori Committee. Um, so they, they resolved to have those okay. two there representing uh, broadly the tai whenua made it, making up that Māori Committee. Okay, so yep. I heard that this type of was part of that decision. Was part of that decision making. I yes. yes, I understand. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Tanya. Kia ora, Kaito. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to raise around membership following on from that last comment was paragraph 4.3 of the terms of reference refers to up to two members and one alternative being appointed by the Regional Planning Committee members of the Hawkesbury Regional Council. I'm not sure how familiar the other councils are with it, but it's a committee of 50% councillors, 50% um, representatives from each of the post-settlement governance entities. At our last meeting uh, last week, uh, we agreed that we would put to this um, committee at the meeting today a request for each of the PSGEs to be invited to be part of this committee. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a precedent for that, which is the Coastal Hazards um, Strategy Joint Committee, which has a defined area from Clifton to Tang Oil, and all the councils that are um, part of that area, as well as the PSGEs who have interests in that area mm. are part of that joint committee. So both councils in Tangata Whenua of that area are part of that committee. And um, acknowledge the representation here already of um, two representatives for the Māori Committee. However, in terms of the PSGEs, we as treaty partners also wanted to be able to have representation here and not have it be determined by another committee, which is the Regional Planning Committee um, members electing or determining to. The, I guess what we're peeling it back to is partnership. So offering the, the other partners, um, the PSGs, the opportunity to be part of this. I mean, these are, these are fundamental issues and questions that we'll be determining. And uh, our view is it's best to have us all in the same room discussing it at the same time. So that, that's the request. And what that amendment would look like is um, to 4.3, something like up to one member and one alternate appointed to represent the post-treaty settlement governance entities, PSGs and Hawke's Bay. That means we would have roughly similar numbers as councillors. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I can't say, can't speak for all the PSGs whether they'd actually have the capacity or desire to appoint someone to this committee. But I think it is good practice and good partnership to invite the other partner to be having representation at this committee. So that those were my comments, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Tanya. Can I just confirm um, then in these um, papers? It suggests yourself and Kiri Dorpiha as representatives. Can uh, is that um, is that uh, not true? So we can change that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Correct. Yeah. That Correct. was. I think we jumped the gun on that. I think we. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you like to respond, Desiree? Yeah, sure. I, I think if the committee is happy, we could take this offline and work with um, our Māori, like Petty and our Māori Partnerships Group and try and um, bring back a, 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 a suggestion as to how we could um, get the full representation um, as requested, and so it would mean a, t a change to the terms of reference. So I, I really do need to seek the committee's view on st next steps. Committee members? <coughs> Got it, Anne. Kia ora. I do support what Tony is saying. Can I just, oh, sorry, um, Denise. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't see your hand up. I just wanted to, um, to support Tania. Tania's um, kōrero and because Tato Tato, I noticed um, 
and I don't know if they're sitting in that committee, Tania, Tato Tato, as our PSG, but it would be great just to invite. I mean, if they if, if they choose not to, if they think that there's enough representation for wider around the table already, that's fine. But just that invite, I think. <coughs> Thank you, Denise. Uh, sorry, Anne. All right. Um, yeah, I do support what Tony is saying because I think the coastal hazards model is a really good one and works well. And as she says, there may or may not be input from some of the groups, but at least offer the opportunity to do that thing. So I yeah, am supportive. Alex? Um, thank you. Uh, I like the idea of, um, so Tanya's offered a practical solution um, around how we could exhibit partnership um, uh, when, it, when it comes to the PSG representation. Um, and I like that idea of making sure we genuinely do reflect that and it's not just what we've assumed to be that. Um, uh, but, but I don't know whether what has been suggested is going to fulfil that. Um, so that's a recommendation from the RPC, which is obviously different from what's come from Māori Committee. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to... Um, uh, don't want to get involved with how you know the the how that representation mix needs to be, but I certainly would like to see us reflect partnership in the most in the most practical and representative way that we can. Kilda, any other comment, um, Councillor Brosnan? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, speaking in support of the co-papa that, um, that Tanya raised, I think um, we had an opportunity this morning, the Mayor and I, to talk about this, um, and it is something that we just come at from a principal's perspective. So, in mm -hmm. principle, we support PSGEs being supported um, and, and being represented with mana in the way that they, they choose, and um, that, that being an equal partnership. So, yeah, we, we support, in principle, that discussion, and I think, as Mayor Walker said, um, we wouldn't get into the details of the how, but would support yep. that conversation being had. Kia ora, thank you. Kia ora, Paul. <clears throat> the uh, aspect of uh, partnership is, is really well taken care of. We spoke about this at Māori Committee level, and uh, the reason why Roger and I are here, we represent the Māori Committee on behalf of all the members. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could have had all the Māori members here, but we just chose us two to, to represent. So... Um, and in answer to your question, uh, um, um, who's a, Tanya? Uh, no, not Tanya. Uh, the other one there. Denise. 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 Sorry, Denise. Uh, Katarina is uh, your <coughs> your member for the um, Tato Tato. She's on that Māori committee. So the Māori committee is well represented for the PSGs, and there's only a small couple of us that represent the Māori committee. Uh, if you want to change that and make it broader, then that's fine by me. I don't mind, but uh, I'm just trying to streamline it a bit so that mm -hmm. we go forward and quickly. Um, Matu Roger. Uh, no, my only discussion with, about this is um, functionality. Mm -hmm. So, what is the purpose of this? This group. And um, how big does it get in terms of its function? Mm -hmm. I'm not about it. Representation is simply that if it's a, if it's, a, if it's a very large group, then I don't think the word action is appropriate because it will be a discussion forum as opposed to an action group. Thank you, Matua. Uh, any other comments moving forward? Uh, Tanya? Sorry, is that Tanya Hopmans? Oh, yes, Tanya Hopmans. Sorry, your hand, your hand was up. <laughs> Hi. Um, just coming back to what Matua, um, Roger Marker was saying, I do note that the Regional Planning Committee is a large committee. Um, I think it has 18 members. We managed to get through business. I think the key issue is focus preparedness and, you know, making decisions. So I, I still believe it's important to have our PSGEs in the room. And as I say, we may not end up with that larger number, but I think it's appropriate to invite them. Mm -hmm. If that's the end of comment for that, um, 
terms of reference seem to be have been addressed and any questions and comments from that. Uh, membership confirmation, we have Wairo in there and to be confirmed for RPC, uh, which if I could advise you, Desiree, to work with, um, with Piri and, and possibly you, Tanya, around who uh, will come on to this committee, Kapoi, so we can take that offline. Kilda. So if everyone is happy with those recommendations for this item, can I please have a mover and a seconder? Um, Hayley, as your mover and seconder, and Zane, uh, would you like to speak to those recommendations? Uh, I think we've had a good discussion and um, you know, it's exciting to get us all around the table for a common purpose. Kilda, Sam? No comment. Uh, any other speakers? There are none. All those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Kilda Koto. Uh, we are moving on to the election of the Deputy Chair. Um, so there are a few ways to view uh, the Deputy Chair's uh, strength skills positions, whether it be within Hawke's Bay Regional Council or outside, um, or um, our Te Tangan Te Whenua rep. So um, I will open up for nominations, um, having that in mind. <laughs> well, I'm happy to nominate... <laughs> now I'm looking at the devil. No, I will leave it to you. Stop. Because <laughs> no one's jumping at this. I'll nominate Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I've got too much to do as a leader. I think there is someone with a better skills base that could, I'm um, sure, that could take that on. Um, I'm happy to nominate Councillor Hayley Brown as the Deputy Chair of our Coastal Hazards Committee as well. Yeah. I'll second Hayley. Hi. Any other nominations? There are none. So all those who agree for Councillor Hayley Brown uh, to become Deputy Chair of this committee, say aye. 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 Those against? Carried. Kilda. Well done. Well done, Hayley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're on to our informational items now, Koto. So uh, item six is the climate resilience development item. Uh, purpose and objectives in the recovery context, very pertinent. So who would like to lead us in this? Yeah. Yep, um, Kilda. I'll be leading that. Alison, should it be? I've got some slides to share with you and then time for discussion. Uh, this is, I'll take the paper as read, but there are some pieces of it that I'm drawing out to really focus on and, and have a discussion around. So, yes, this is the one. Okay. Um, so, yeah, looking at extreme weather events, then a short um, discussion of donut economics, which is being used as a decision-making framework by some local governments um, overseas, so I wanted to share that with you. Then quite a lot of discussion about climate resilient development, because uh, I think that's particularly relevant to our context in Hawke's Bay at the moment, and um, then recovery context as well. To bring this, to really discuss and think about how this committee fits within the structure that's being established at the moment in the recovery context in Hawke's Bay. So um, we used to, well, I used to show slides like this to tell you, well, to, to share um, extreme weather that we've observed at our own windows from this building. But um, you know, there's a tornado, I think, forming there. There's just things we didn't used to see. But no one in Hawke's Bay needs these kind of slides anymore to agree that we are experiencing extreme weather right now in our region, and we're really feeling the impact of that. Um, so this, I 
I wanted to share this because this is being used, uh, this is Donut Economics, you've probably heard of Kate Raworth and her Donut Economics work. Uh, what you have there is um, the donut in the green and um, we've got the social foundation, that's like the lowest level to which we want to raise um, all of our communities and all of our people. That represents things like education, life satisfaction, um, equality, employment, Oh, sorry, my screen goes black, but yours doesn't. Okay, um, so we want to lift everyone to some basic minimum levels of life, of quality of life. At the same time, not going over this ecological ceiling. So in reference to those planetary boundaries, these um, seven planetary boundaries in this model. And um, so this was from 1992. This was what was um, mapped for Aotearoa. We were falling behind on equality and employment. Those are inside the donut there. Um, so there were people who were not meeting the basic minimum level. And we were overshooting on four of the seven. The, uh, the grey areas on the um, right there are just not known. We didn't have the data. So we were overshooting in um, our emissions, our material footprint, ecological footprint, and land use change. Now, um, just last month, Kate Raworth and Andrew Fanning presented to our Treasury, New Zealand Treasury, and this was the updated in, um, you know, in a, the span of about 30 years. We've, so the positive in there is we have managed to lift people from, um, so you'll see in the middle of the donut, we're only um, falling short on equality, and we've got complete data in the middle there, um, but we are massively overshooting what the planetary boundary, what our natural resources on this planet can sustain in all of those areas. And there's one, still one area we didn't have data, enough data to make a um, judgment, and that's blue water. But um, you see there the phosphorus is really off the chart, nitrogen, CO2 emissions, material footprint, ecological footprint, and land use change. So the re well, this is being used as a decision-making framework, which I think might be useful potentially as this committee moves forward. But... Um, yeah, I also wanted to show this to you because I like it that we have to maintain social foundations while not overshooting. So really aiming for that donut. So climate resilient development, which you've got um, a fair, you know, there's a discussion of that in the paper, what that means, what that might look like. These are just some slides to really distill it down. Uh, the most simple explanation of climate resilient development, which, by the way, is a term that's um, widely used by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, those reports are signed off by 195 governments, so it has wide global support. Most simple explanation of it is, is when mitigation efforts to reduce emissions comes together with adaptation if it's to adjust to a changed climate. And in that middle area there, there are really some um, impactful solutions that can support, support sustainable development for all. Um, and so this question of should we just adapt, should we mitigate, how does it fit together? I thought it was important to put a slide on this. Uh, adaptation is... So if we are to adapt to unbridled climate change, this is extremely transformative and extremely costly. Transformative not in a good way. Uh, post two degrees of warming, post three degrees of warming, we really start reaching those limits of livability. Um, there's some words there that are used by the UN, you know, code red for humanity, global unrest, food insecurity, talking at a global scale, massive migration and economic loss. So if we were just to say we're not going to mitigate, that's what it looks like and that is extremely transformative and costly and quality of life doesn't improve. Adaptation and mitigation, when they come together in the types of climate resilient development that we're aiming for, you can slow the pace of climate change and by reducing those adaptation needs and costs. Uh, better health and well-being, that's what we're really aiming for, for our communities, for our people. Uh, and that third point there, I think that's important, less dependency on fossil fuels. We know that fossil fuels are finite on the planet. We know that they will run out at a time. And if you help communities to transition to lower emissions, less dependency, you're helping them to future-proof. So if we think of um, you know, these floods that happened in summer, if that happened in the middle of August, it could have been a very different picture because a week without electricity 
you wouldn't have had so much of the fridge problems, but a week without electricity <laughs> can really, you know, there can be some health consequences that we could have been really concerned on. So we need to be thinking about lowering our community's dependency on fossil fuels and that creates more resilience. So that also, the quote down there, everything, everywhere, all at once, that comes from um, Antonio Guterres in the last report, the last IPCC summary report. So it's really stressing the urgency of this work that we're doing and that it's not just a siloed one pathway. We really have to be thinking holistically, I think Mare said earlier, holistically and inter intergenerationally. And communication of sci science-based projections, I see that as a key role too for this work, mm -hmm. that if we have scientific reports that we know about in the council, uh, our role is to be communicating that to our communities too so they can be empowered. So I had to think about what might be already going on in climate resilient development examples, and I've just got a few here to share, but to really make it concrete what that means. There's the Land for Life Partnership, which is the old um, right tree, right place. Um, when we plant trees, that's obviously carbon sequestration, but it's also shade for stock. It's also erosion control. So you're really getting multiple benefits out of that. Cyclists on stock banks. That's obviously an adaptation measure, flood protection, flood control scheme, but we're encouraging safe, active transport. And we're also encouraging leisure, um, bike riding and health. Streets for people, um, this is Carlisle Strait and Napier, but I know there's some work in Central Hawke's Bay as well in the same um, kind of vein, streets for people, where making our streets safer, encouraging active transport, putting more greenery in, so it cools down those urban areas with trees and sequestering carbon, fewer cars on the road. The ones in bullet points there are things um, that I think are really potential for our region and might come out of think something like an emissions reduction plan. Energy efficient homes, you know, we saw in the budget that the government has massively increased the um, warmer, warmer Kiwi Homes program um, to offer insulation, better insulation. And this one really has so many benefits, I could just make a whole slide on it. But you've got health benefits from living in a, in a more energy efficient home, cost reductions for the people living in that home, increased resilience to weather events, um, like I said, if, if power is out again. Greening urban spaces, and there's been some work done recently um, with Hawke's Bay Biodiversity about what that might mean about planting trees in car parks because there's some fantastic imagery of the heat of a city centre in summer and it just off the asphalt, it's an, um, the, you know, the bright red in the images and then once you put a tree in there, that's actually cooling. So while our focus at the moment has been and naturally so on flooding, we still need to be thinking about heat waves. We've been, Hawke's Bay and Tairawhiti have been identified as the areas of New Zealand to suffer the most um, with heat waves going into the future. Wetlands, again, this is an area that we need to be thinking about and we really need um, some better data on the potential for blue carbon sequestration. So what that means is marshes, wetlands, um, those intertidal spaces that we know they sequester carbon at quite a high rate potentially higher than some types of forestry. Um, and that work is you know, ha happening at the forefront of research at the moment. So in the meanwhile, while we don't know, we need to be protecting those spaces. Um, biodiversity benefits, water retention, flood management, and this idea of 20 minute cities, which I'm sure you've all sort of heard the idea floated of 20 minute cities, which have benefits for social con connectivity, job housing proximity, and reduced transport emissions. Um, so some key messages really around how we might bring this into our recovery efforts. When we are working on risk production models, we have to be taking into account climate change scenarios. We absolutely must be doing that under um, various pathways, those SSPs or RCPs, thinking about what it might look like. I mean, as I drove to work this morning, I was listening to the radio and Waka Kotahi has said that until very recently, they didn't take climate change into account in their work. Now that they are, they've actually said some roads may be unviable. That was the, um, yeah, that was the news So we need to be doing that today. We can no longer be making risk models without taking climate change into account. And Tom will talk a bit more about that. Uh, and our adaptation solutions should promote better quality of life, that donut bringing people into that green donut. And yeah, I think I've covered that point already. Transitioning to lower emissions builds community resilience if we reduce dependency on fossil fuels. 
when, when we talk about climate change, though, we do have to recognise it's a symptom of a larger ecological collapse. Biodiversity loss is poor water quality, increased pollution. So when we're making solutions, if they cover multiple areas, there, um, those are the kind of solutions we want to be looking for. Long-term planning, holistic considerations, I think. Mare took those words out of my mouth anyway <laughs> earlier. Uh, okay, so uh, here I, I went through everyone's locality plans and um, these were just some key funding actions. This is not to say these are the only funding actions that have been put in for um, in the, those locality plans and the bids for funding, but just so that we're kind of all aware of what each other's doing. The, um, this first one, Climate Change Adaptation and Resilience Strategy, I think that's in the Hastings um, locality plan. Spatial-based regional climate change vulnerabilities assessment and a regional emissions reduction plan was from the Regional Council Environmental Resilience Plan and HAPU uh, Environmental and Climate Change Plan is from the Napier City Plan. So that's really just information sharing. Uh, and so that's just to finish, you know, to say we've known pain in our communities before. We've known pain, destruction, and mm -hmm. we've had to rebuild. And we didn't build for the past. We didn't. We built things that we're still benefiting from a hundred years later. So, just to encourage you, that was my great granddad's photo on the left. So, um, that yeah, just to encourage you that we really do know we have done this before, and we are able to do this. And long-term planning is what we want. So happy to take questions on any of those content in the slides or on what is in the paper that's been distributed, the um, climate resilient development. Kia ora, thank you, Pippa. Great presentation to set the scene. Do we have uh, questions for Pippa? Tim. Uh, Pippa, you, you talked at the beginning, there was a couple of slides there with land change, and I know it's in red. Um, I'm and forgive me if there's actually reports out there around land change because there's a lot of stuff I have to read over my time and I may not have read it, but just an understanding what you mean by what is land change and is it is in, in how that is measured so that as we go forward, we can understand because not all land change is bad. No. Mm. You know, some of it's good. So I just want to understand how that's measured and if we're going to go forward and we're going to use that measurement that's starting today, how do we actually measure what goes forward in this group? And actually, how is that measured? Mm. Um, so it's one of those planetary boundaries. Um, and I, th I think without getting into the detail of it, which I don't, don't know off the top of my head, it is um, land use that then has a negative impact on our environment. So when we're taking away trees, when we're drying up wetlands, when we're... Um, when whatever we do to the land then has a pollution effect. So, so and, and, and sorry, just to say, that's a really global, this is not a New Zealand specific, I gave you the New Zealand data, but the planetary boundaries work is a very global thing. So we're talking also like um, in, you know, the Horn of Africa has experienced a famine at the moment because they can't grow their crops with the kind of heat that they're seeing and the lack of rain. So it's a very, very global measure, and it's an application to New Zealand may need tweaking or well, oh, and also perhaps the Sorry, the um, so in this case, it's talking about um, uh, main there are two sort of main land use changes that uh contribute to emissions. The first is um, deforestation of indigenous uh bush, and the second is urbanisation uh, that's eating away our productive agricultural land. Yeah. So just to follow on that, so as we progress and we see land change change for the better, is that going to be taken into account? So we may have some bad, but is it going to um, yeah. so if you take it out, measure it, what's the word I want when it... One positive and a negative equals oh, it, it out. Oh, it cancels each other out. Yeah, so each we're cancelling it out because... You know, my lifetime in land use, I've seen some land change that was bad back in the 80s when we were paid to cut down scrub and mm -hmm. on our farms. Yeah. But now we see farmers doing riparian rights and they see farmers planting again. Yeah. Is that being measured um, going forward or are we just going to use the global one to show that actually all land change is bad, whereas a lot of land change is actually good? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, yeah. The, um 
Well, because often those things like planting have multiple benefits. The water quality improves, yeah, the use I of phosphorus that, yeah. and nitrate. So it would actually impact all of those things. And in our emissions profile that we look at later on in, the, in another agenda item, we look at the sequestration in the region, so the specific tree coverage and the types of forestry covering in the region. So, so what you're saying is that we will set a, um, a stand, well not a stand, we'll draw on the line where our land is right now and as we go forward we'll be able to measure the benefits be as we go forward. Yep. So we'll Sorry. understand what is in Hawke's Bay, a greater part, mm. and what land's being used for what and what's good and, and how we're going to mitigate going forward. Mm. So for this item, Pippa, did you want to explore, seek any feedback or further advice from the committee? Um, no, I think they're, I think they're probably best that kind of advice um, to come after the emissions reduction consideration. Okay. In the item. Um, Sounds good. Just to see Are there any other questions or comments yeah. before we move on? Uh, we've got quite a bit to get through and we'll start diving into the nitty gritty in the next items, Kapoi. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Pippa. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, um, our spatial climate vulnerability assessment. We have our Manuhiri here to present for us. Kia ora, welcome. Uh, uh, yeah, as I said, kia ora koutou. Ko te takanaka, ko tūia kuri te ao e mahi ni akumaharara. No ahuri o Waiheki, uh, so I grew up in um, Waihek, just across the road from the Silky Oak Chocolate Factory, uh, uh, just outside of Taradale. Um, which of course, made yeah, me. Yeah, around uh, the corner from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thankfully, uh, my parents moved up onto the hill, so I wasn't uh, stressing in the last. Uh, I now live in Christchurch, uh, where I where I work, but. Um, yeah, it's made it uh, more personal than normal um, with, with parents up here. Yeah. But um, so, like I said, I'm now a uh, senior lecturer in civil engineering at the University of Canterbury, but my PhD and my specialisation uh, from the University of Michigan in the United States is on risk analysis. And so my expertise is, is around climate and natural hazards adaptation. Um, and we started, my uh, student and I about two years ago started a company called uh, Urban Intelligence because uh, we were doing work with the Christchurch City Council on their climate change uh, risk assessment and adaptation planning and realised that the tools uh, that were available to councils weren't moving fast enough. Uh, so, as you know, uh, the legislative uh, environment has changed quite quickly in the last few years our communities are required to assess their climate risks, our companies are required to assess their climate risks. We're all required to uh, present adaptation plans. The new um, proposed Emergency Management Act requires us to consider our emergency levels of service for our infrastructure. Uh, we are required to assess the emission potential from new spatial planning uh, or the new spatial plans. And so as part of that, we have to identify areas that are both resilient and sustainable. So thinking about both mitigation and adaptation, which really puts a lot of, uh, um, puts quite a burden on our communities, our iwi, our businesses, our uh, councils. And one of the big challenges I think that we've seen around New Zealand is that everyone has to make consequential decisions today based on varying uh, based on inconsistent information and inconsistent approaches. So this is one of the key things that we're trying to address. Because how do we align decisions around adaptation, around land use planning, around service provision, uh, both internally and externally when we're relying on different pieces of information? How do we build trust with communities when we're using different, uh, when we're using inconsistent information and approaches? How do we distribute funding from a national or a regional level when there is different information being relied upon? And how do those government agencies monitor and evaluate actions? Uh, so essentially what we've put together and what we're developing in our, um, in our team is this platform to support uh, and integrate risk-informed information. So it's not just this sort of hand-wavy notion that's, uh, that sits on the side, but something that's uh, tangible and practical 
uh, so that we can embed it into our spatial planning and our uh, asset management. So we're working around New Zealand uh, from Christchurch right up to far north. Uh, we work with businesses as well, uh, specifically some in, in, Christ, in Hawke's Bay. Uh, and we have a team of uh, 10 of us at uh, our company, but also we're supported by postgraduate students who do research and we funnel that really quickly into practice because we basically don't have time to wait for research to slowly uh, meander over into, into action. So I'll show you uh, what we've been doing with uh, Hawke's Bay and then show you what a, a sort of gold standard approach looks like uh, with really good data that we've put together in Christchurch. Uh, and then show you some of the changes that are coming uh, coming down the down the pipeline. So, as I said, what we're trying to do is make risk information tangible. And the uh, the key thing here is that we've put together this web-based map that currently is uh, uh, pulling together publicly available hazard information, and then really saying, so what? What does this mean for our communities? So, what we're seeing here is uh, the current known um, river flood information for the region and the areas uh, shown in grey are the ones that uh, weren't studied so there isn't information around the, the risk uh, so and what we can do is uh, pull in information from the council's assets uh, so for example we can look at all of the roads here that would be uh, uh, affected or uh, damaged by this uh, by this flood. In the data set, there are there is residential buildings, there is uh, landfills and contaminated sites. We have electricity information. Uh, we can look at different information from the natural domain, uh, and we can look at information around how it affects communities. So, but to give you a clear example of what that will look like uh, as we continue to develop this as the uh, Christchurch uh, risk tool. Essentially what we're doing what we're doing here, what we're able to do here is look at uh, information that they've provided around hazards, so coastal erosion, coastal flooding. Um, in Hawke's Bay we've got landslides, uh, liquefaction and other inland hazards, so this is um, not just coastal. We're working with Fire Emergency New Zealand to bring in land, uh, sorry, to bring in wildfires. And we've pulled in newer data on uh, soil moisture deficit, uh, rainfall and drought changes. You can see that we can change this under different sea level or climate scenarios. Uh, and then we can, as I showed before, we can look at the impact to, in this case, roads. What you can now do here is hover over any of these assets at a really granular level and see what would the expected damage be under this scenario. So with 150 centimetres of sea level rise, you'd expect medium damage to the to ferry road and medium groundwater rise risk. But what that actually means, and one of the things that we really care about is, well, what happens to our communities? So all of these hexagons in red show where people are cut off. Uh, and this obviously a really uh, salient issue uh, following, uh, especially in parts of New Zealand. But we can see that there would be 23 homes isolated as a result of that uh, damage. We can look at uh, the way that we are uh, setting this up or have set this up with Christchurch City Council is that it automatically pulls from their asset management uh, system so that as they update their assets it uh, reflects in here and it pushes it back uh, to tell them what their, uh, their risk is. You can look at residential buildings, you can look at any uh, information that, uh, that the council has to any known climate hazard. We can also look at uh, things around um, ecological sites, and one of the key things that uh, I imagine at one stage uh, this committee may, may be thinking about is making decisions around adaptation. Uh, and it's important not just to focus on infrastructure uh, because we need, as we're adapting, we should be thinking about our infrastructure, our built environment, our natural environment, our economy, uh, and our community well-being. 
So this particular wetland, uh, the Teddington wetland, is highly has high ecological value, uh, but also high cultural value because of Mahanga Kai. This wetland isn't uh, threatened by sea level rise. It is, however, threatened because we built a road through the middle of it, which means it can't adapt to that change, uh, the changing uh, sea level. So when we sit down with uh, decision makers and councillors uh, and the technical advisors at the Christchurch City Council, they're able to say, well, what are the options uh, for this road protecting the isolation or protecting uh, the residents from being isolated and protecting that, that wetland. So what are all of the, the things that we can think about uh, simultaneously? In Hawke's Bay, we've been working with uh, one of your uh, key uh, horticultural uh, companies that works in uh, both Hastings and Central, and they are required to report on what are called their climate financial disclosures. And one of the key things for them is understanding both their physical risks, so the risks such as these from hazards, but also their transition risks, so what might the impact be from uh, introduced uh, regulation. For them, it's really important to understand where they should be positioning orchards, how they should be, uh, what varieties they should be thinking about growing in future to, uh, to best be suited for those changing growing conditions. But also, it's really important for them to understand the, uh, the growing conditions that their competitors might face internationally. Because to your point, uh, Central Hawke's Bay, um, Alex, and, uh, we actually are exposed, but potentially are far less exposed than some of our competitors. So how can we make sure that we're growing sustainable and resilient food here in New Zealand that we can export internationally uh, and outdo our competitors in Chile and Texas uh, and other parts of the country that may, uh, and other parts of the world that may be far, far more exposed to uh, climate changes. So what we're building at the moment is a major update to this that uh, essentially puts this on a, uh, creating this national, national tool that lets us then report uh, into, from the local level to the regional level uh, to the national level uh, which is going to streamline the, the national risk assessments in future. So that rather than, cons rather than relying on information that is six years uh, old, we have this living information that updates every time our assets change, uh, every time our hazards change. And we can do that a fraction of the, the cost of, a, of traditional approaches. And then also allow our teams to use uh, information such as this to think about uh, their future uh, their future land use planning uh, and, for example, be identifying areas to build or invest in that are uh, that reduce the risk but also increase the um, sustainability or reduce the potential for uh, fuel dependence. So there's a fair few things that we're working on relatively rapidly. Uh, the, the dashboard or the platform is the key thing that, that we're focused on. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about shortly is the uh, hazard gap analysis because the data, the, the results and the decisions are, well, are only as good as the data that underlies it. But having said that, we still have to be making pretty major decisions based on uh, the data we have at the moment. And then thinking about how this can be best used in terms of adaptation uh, and long-term planning, making community engagement sort of a richer experience and a more informative experience and then tying this into spatial planning. Um, so, I guess the main thing here is that um, as part of this process, we've done a huge, uh, or we've done a deep dive into the data that's available around the region uh, from asset and hazard. Naturally, there's uh, just there are discrepancies, and this is really important to identify, I think, because uh, at the end of the day, we're making decisions around uh, adaptation and allocation of funding and things like that. We need to make sure that uh, even where there are areas that we don't have lots of data, we're not ignoring them. Mm. Uh, or just because one, and we're seeing this uh, nationally as well. For example, Christchurch City can say we have major risks, and that's because they understand those risks, whereas um, Buller Council, for example, uh, doesn't. 
we need to make sure we're not investing all that money into the uh, more informed area. But also, um, yeah, well, I'll leave that to you guys as the decision makers. <laughs> uh, I'll just provide the information. Um, so yeah, we're working through trying to improve this data uh, and working with NIWA, working with Wildlife New Zealand, Wildlife New Zealand, Fire and Emergency Management New Zealand on wildfires uh, and uh, other things such, pulling in information around seismic hazard as well. So I will uh, wrap that up and open to any questions. Kia ora Tom, thank you. Um, a great tool that you've been able to build. Um, which we want to keep having access to and um, include our data points or those data points that are missing, the gaps. Yep. Um, and so in the paper, it talks about um, uh, recovery funding um, applied for mm. to be able to fill those gaps. Mm. What's plan B if we don't get any recovery funding for this exercise? Is there any thought around yeah. that? And and what are we talking, how much are we talking, if you can um, advise us on the next stage for gap filling? Um, the gap filling, I think I'll hand to Tom in a second, but the gap filling, the, the information needs to come from third um, third parties like mm. NIWA or consultants who, can, who have those specialist skills to go out and find that data. Now, um, it's, it's, well, it's a daily changing place because there is a lot of funding going to people like NIWA to do f new flooding models. So that's that's potentially something that we'll benefit from, that some of this data will be rapidly available because central government funding is going to research. Um, but, yeah, what do you think? Because it it's third party that we're going to need to have to yep. engage, right? Yep, so we don't do the hazard modelling itself. Um, we take in any of the hazard modeling that's available. One of the challenges is the not all hazard models are created equal. So, uh, for example, today NIWA released uh, national maps showing the extent of hazard uh, of coastal flooding, but they didn't uh, release the depth of that. Uh, mm. So, basically, that doesn't tell us anything about the vulnerability that our uh, assets, our infrastructure. Uh, and so there's some challenges around that uh, Sort of, yeah, but I guess we're working as as close, as best we can with uh, other entities like well, uh, Fire and Emergency New Zealand mm -hmm. to get that uh, information, and then um, I guess also diving into the data that uh, was already held in the council and by different people in different places, and trying to actually bring it all together. Mm. Which yeah, I sh it's harder than it. <laughs> Um, I should say, so this work began about October last year. We started mm. working with Tom. So at the moment, at, at that time, it was between, so Hawke's Bay Regional Council paid for that initial phase with Urban Intelligence. And um, since the cyclone, it's kind of obviously been, there's been more eyes on this and it's got more potential to really inform what we need right now. So if we, um, plan B for funding really would be a commitment, a cross-council commitment to be, finding the, the funding for that to move it faster and to make sure it's happening. I mm. think if that answers your question. Yeah. Originally, this was a climate action piece of work that the Regional Council was doing, um, had committed to stage one. Mm. In the context of recovery, I think it needs to go faster and have be of more use to more groups. Uh, so we would need cross-council commitment. Tom, it's a quick Zan. Thank you. Hey, Chair, uh, Chair, I just wanted to ask Tom, you mentioned uh, a national, a potential national applicability. Can you just just explain that a little bit more and what, where that's at, and what sort of support or otherwise you either have or are looking for? Yeah. Um, sorry, I breathed over quite a bit in there. So, my, I guess, there are different, lots of different conversations, lots of different requirements um, happening at the moment, and one of the it seems that every government agency could use uh, or is trying to find risk information. And so we're trying, we're in the process of having conversations with some of those agencies to say, instead of everyone doing different things, and instead of you all requiring, instead of requiring every single council to do their own analysis, which using different information and different approaches, why don't we get a, 
a proper um, sort of a single national uh, source of information, but not one that's top down, but one that's sort of that's built uh, bottom up. And I think that's the the tension at the moment, uh, and has been really valuable with working with um, different councils to actually develop something hand in hand that we know works and answers the questions that they're trying to answer. Uh, so we're still having those conversations. Um, yeah, but uh, like in, in my view, this should be something that is uh, centrally funded um, and the hazards should be, uh, there should be a national stock take of hazards so that, uh, and we're seeing moves in that direction. Uh, although the pace might not be as fast as we would like it to be. All right, thank you. Oh, kia ora, Tanya. Tanya Hopman. Kia ora, thanks, Tom. Um, love your maps. Um, just wanting to ask about the stage two that's mentioned in the paper around some gap filling. And there's a reference there to um, some sub subdomains and one of them is Kaupapa Māori. I heard you mention Mahinga Kai and I'm wondering what other what other items you would be looking to to collect data on and map and, and I'm I guess I'm wondering is that include not just Mahinga Kai but things like Wahi Taonga, Marae locations for example. I'm just wondering what kind of information you're looking for and how you how you propose to source that? Yep. Um, so, I we can only do that in partnership with the with um, Mana Whenua. I don't have. Um, sorry, I feel like I would like to be looking at you on the screen. Uh, um, the way that we're working with uh, iwi and Mana Whenua around the country is that we sit down at the and say, how best can we support your process? What information would you like uh, to be included to support the adaptation planning that you are doing? It's not a case of we're trying to collect and <coughs> gather the data. The way that we operate is that uh, the data is owned and hosted by uh, the iwi that we work with, and we can present it on the tool, uh, but we're not, uh, essentially it's totally up to each of the uh, iwi or hapu that we work with as to what information they want to provide, because obviously uh, that data is sensitive. That? I'm happy to go on. There's, there's a whole, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, work being done in that space, so I can go into more detail if you'd like. I, I suppose it's more around, um, in terms of Hawke's Bay and the PSGs and Taifina as well, um, there are certain data sets that they have. So I just wondered what you normally access, but you, what you're saying is you have a conversation first. But maybe maybe it might be more helpful to know what kinds of kaupapa Māori or items you have mapped in the past, just to give us some idea yep. of what that might look like. So um, uh, I, sh I should also say that we've been working with um, Ngāti Hinamanu on their uh, recovery. So, um, and... At the moment, currently, Marae and Māori land are mapped. Uh, in Christchurch, there's the, um, a cultural uh, spatial layer in their uh, district plan. Also, um, through discussion and identifying where site, ecological sites are that are of mahinga kai value, uh, any, essentially any spatial information that, uh, that is valuable. But uh, the, um, the work from some of our... Uh, Maori risk scholars sort of identifies like for us to understand and again this has been done at a national level so we need to have that discussion around what is applicable but we typically measure um, impacts to the built environment the natural environment and the social environment so the tangible spatial impacts and then from there we can derive uh, and understand the indirect or what are called cascading risks onto uh, other less tangible social outcomes in the economy. From a Māori perspective, that typically includes sort of living, uh, living things, uh, healthy people, Māori enterprise, and tikanga Māori. Thank you. Kia ora, Māori. 
Hey, um, thanks for that. And just to um, cobble on to um, what Tania has just um, um, given some further insights to. Tom, yeah, and I think too, um, really, you know, having to preserve, protect and promote Tonga and Matauranga Māori in the space, we're all in this together. There's no two ways that underpin where I'm coming from in terms of promoting the well-being of our communities, uh, particularly Hiritanga, Ahuriri, Wairo and Tamatea. And, and I guess the thing here is that um, IP is going to be, and it's just starting to arrive in the way that data sovereignty and how all of those particular models are forming. Um, however, you know, flora and fauna, um, particularly in the data sets that I think that you're looking to provide in terms of the best of um, 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 information, um, the quality of information that's going to make some effective decision making processes with us all. Just to acknowledge you, kia ora for, for, for the data. Sorry guys, I had to pop out, I had a manuhiri turn up here, and so I missed most of what you had to say. But <laughs> well, you, well, you <laughs> said the right thing, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. And maybe I'll just add, the, the, the tool that we've created has like a sign in so that based on who you are, you get to see different levels of information. So um, if you're a, a member of the public, you can see what information has been designated as public. If you're a company, you can see information that's been designated as public or uh, appropriate for you, as well as all of your assets. And equally, uh, iwi or hapu can see council information, assuming that that's signed, so publicly approved council information, as well as uh, any information that is sensitive uh, to them. Kia ora, Annette. Uh, kia ora, Tom. Thank you very much for the presentation. I found it really interesting. Um, obviously, that really broad environmental scan you've done to find all that data and put it all in one place was very impressive. Um, so a couple of questions from me. I was in reading the paper, stage four jumped out at me as someone who's particularly interested in when we start um, doing that doing that actual work around making recommendations on the ground. Yep. Um, and so there's a, there's a workshop process in there which you describe in the paper as semi-quantitative. So I was interested in what that means and what sort of qualitative um, information you're bringing into that. Um, so that's my first question. And my second one is around, um, obviously, climate resilient development and how we use this tool um, will be heavily impacted by the national reform and, in particular, that Natural and Built Environment Act. So I'm just interested in, in whether you had any commentary for how, how those two are overlapping. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so commentary on the reform keeping in mind this being recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it probably needs to happen a little bit faster, um, but it's super, obviously it's super, um, yeah, I, don't, I feel like I say that and it's also super technical. I, um, they need to be clearer around who's paying and when, what the, um, uh, because at the moment we've got everyone doing, uh, going in different directions and setting different precedent. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's going to be an interesting process, especially if uh, there's a change of government and it changes direction again. Um, to answer your first question, um, risk isn't um, objective. So what I perceive as a risk uh, might be quite different to what you perceive as a risk. So I can what we can do with the um, spatial information is to identify what... Uh, where are areas that are exposed or vulnerable, what that quantitative impact is going to be. But I can say that there's a kilometre of road damaged here and a kilometre of road damaged here, but you know that the kilometre of road damaged here is way, way more important than this kilometre based on the impact on the community there, the impact on the economy as a result of that. And so the semi-quantitative, uh, the qualitative information that we're bringing in is that nuance around what matters to uh, local communities. Uh, and so we essentially, the workshops are really important, but it's also really important that they're based on rigorous quantitative information. Uh, that's really special. Thank you. So it's got a really clear link with that step five around community engagement. Oh, when yeah. we talk about that workshop, mm. that's not just at a governance level, that's getting down into engagement. And, and it really depends how, um, how you guys best want to to run it, but in Christchurch and around the country where we've run these, it, have, it has been members 
invited members of the public, uh, but it could be the entire it could be an entire community conversation. Um, and typically, the adaptation planning, which is five, includes the the general public. Mm. Um, but it's also really important that we do that in a way that captures like as uh, as wide a cross section of the public as possible, rather than just the typical. Um, people that, that do engage, because this is really a intergenerational challenge. Uh, thank you. Alex. Uh, thank you. This is, this solves so many problems that I can see in our regional governance and risk assessment. It, it, great work. Awesome. Um, two questions. First one is, uh, how, because this is something potentially councils and property owners will need to make decisions on, how do you scope up peer review into this process? Is it stage by stage? Is it at the end? T talk to me a bit about that. So uh, all of the hazards that we include are um, already reviewed as part of the council process. And then our approach essentially is applying our risk models to assess the impact. Those risk models have been peer reviewed as part of academic processes because we mm -hmm. publish uh, all of the um, the work that we do, uh, and we've also had peer review in the different uh, through the different work that we've done in, in councils. Cool, thank you. And so, um, uh, um, following on from that, I, I had a question about the stages, like Annick did. Um, so, obviously, your group has got the expertise around how to put this modelling together, but what you describe are a whole lot of stages that involve quite a lot of different skill set around risk and um, engagement and planning. Uh, is that is this a project that's led by your company as a consultant, the whole process? Is this a project that HBRC are putting other skills and expertise into? So when we um, started, uh, I guess, started talking to each other, the stages that I've um, that we proposed were what other councils have followed. Mm -hmm. uh, our expertise is around the risk and adaptation, uh, but we tend to work quite collaboratively with other uh, other teams. So that would be my that would be my recommendation. Uh, mm -hmm. Like engagement is important to bring in local knowledge. Uh, the hazards there are there are specialist expertise available around New Zealand that makes sense to to draw on. And following on from that, are our um, Hawke's Bay Civil Defence Emergency Management Group technical staff involved in this project? Who then, currently um, do the risk mapping? They currently do hazard mapping and we've yes. been drawing from that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the the difference between this tool and the uh, hazards portal yeah. is the what is the so what? Like, uh, mm -hmm. what does this mean for our assets? Mm -hmm. uh, and for our like, economy and, and people. So there's that tool is really useful. We've set it up so that it draws from that uh, as well as draws other information. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps also a um, point to make here is that we do need to establish a tag for this committee with cross council membership, and that would be the um, logical place for staff across councils from CEDAM, from all those areas, from planning to be interacting with Tom that hasn't been formalised yet. Right. That would be very useful. Is that, that's next steps? Yeah, that's one of the next steps, absolutely. Okay, yeah. well, um, Zan, and then we'll go to next steps. Thank you. Yep. Got it, Chair. Just, just following up on Alex's comment, um, look, I put um, the, under next steps, we're asked for you know, the feedback on how we see this tool being used, this great tool being used in community engagement. But I put that together with comments at the front uh, under nine about ground truthing, a systematic check. So it, it's, it seems to me that, and, and also thinking about the, when it comes to actually, you know, having a tool that's, in, that's uh, linked to a planning decision for an individual property mm -hmm. level, we're, we're probably a long way from that. Mm -hmm. And so this is more a tool to, and also as, as, as we've discussed that, there's a subjectivity involved in some of these, and as you layer on different risks, that probably the subjectivity and the decision and what you do about that compounding risk probably becomes gets more subjective and less objective. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
I just I, I don't think we should go away from this thinking that this is easily going to land as a tool to say what happens in what bit of land. And we know when we're thinking about zoning just how important those decisions are. But it's going to be a great tool from a, a, a regional and, in, and a local planning point of view, mm. absolutely. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, so just on the next steps, because I also think this would be useful across councils in, into our other uh, groups here. Um, would you agree, Alex and Anita and um, Anne, that this uh, presentation is quite useful and at the right time um, being able to present it to the respective councils and committees? I think this, you know, this is really um, sort of not groundbreaking because <laughs> it happened in Christchurch, um, but actually really useful tool that we can start to um, imagine and articulate a regional story in this space that we haven't been able to uh, utilise yeah. in the past. Yeah. It, I can just add too that when, you know, last year we went through a process of choosing who would do our climate change risk assessment for the region. The other options are quite static. They're not spatial based. They don't come up with a map the options that we had on the table in front of us. They come up with more like an Excel spreadsheet of known risks and then to quantify all of that, there was a lot of engagement and workshops. So we were really excited when we saw this approach and multiple people across the councils looked at it and also agreed that really lucky to have the dynamic nature like if we get new flood modelling or new tidal monitoring tomorrow, it can be integrated. We don't need to go through a full round of, of assessment. So the spatial nature and yeah. so just wanted to add that of why we went for this option um, and how it does really future proof it rather than an Excel document that needs updating every six years. Mm -hmm. And to be able to progress further, you're asking for technical advice from the other other yep. councils to be involved in that. Yep. We'd like to set up a tag with membership from the councils um, and, and from CEDM. Oh, and I mean, we wanted to also be floating these ideas with you to see if we're heading in the right strategic direction. Yeah. I think I'm hearing agreement. Um, and yeah, we'll set up the tag and continue on with the phases planned. Thank you. Is there anyone opposed to that or have comment? Sure. Yeah, a question? Is Alex? that a separate tag to the one we're already going to have for this committee? Uh, no, I think no. it can be the same one. Oh, if, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Great, that's a great I mean, question good, though. Good <laughs> yeah. if, if this work logically sits with your committee, the, the tag would be the same and that would be one yeah. of the tasks that they look. Yeah, um, Mare, kia ora Mare. Kia ora. I'm just thinking aloud now in terms of some in, uh, independent advice besides what council offices and other contributions. I mean, welcome, mm -hmm. of course, Tom and his group to kind of give that perspective, but also um, know that um, in having to kind of get the very best of people, you know, with the right skills, um, that independent <laughs> advice can, fits into where we're going overall. I know it's part of the recovery uh, management aspect too. So thought I'd just put that on the table as well. Thanks. Kia ora mare. If there are no other comments, I think you've got direction from the committee um, to continue. Um, and just thank you, Tom. We uh, look forward to seeing you back again, I'm <coughs> sure. Will you come back stage two? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm never we'll see. <laughs> Kawhi, well. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, so we've got recommendations to to receive and note uh, the assessment as well as the last items as well. Um, so can I have a mover? Thank you, Haley, and a seconder. Uh, thank you, Anne. All those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Kilda Koto. Um, it might be time to grab a coffee and a chocolate bicky, and then we'll be back. Kilda.
Away from them. <laughs> uh, we've had apologies from Matua Roger, who's had to take off. Um, but we'll, look, we'll resume with um, item eight, the case study from Te Tai Tokiro um, in their climate adaptation strategy. So uh, this was an opportunity to... Um, to be able to showcase uh, what other um, parts of Aotearoa are doing in terms of a strategy in climate action. Sorry, I was going to throw things around, but yeah. <laughs> we've actually got time. Surprise. Um, okay, kia ora. Um, it's really exciting to be here, frankly. Um, this is, I've been in my role for 18 months and this is a really cool outcome, um, something regional. Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Um, is Alison. Oh, I, who slides on that? Sorry. Uh, should be, should be, this um, one? Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay, that is disconcerting. All right. Okay, and my notes have disappeared. It's all fine. I'm sure I can just make it up <laughs> as I go along. Um, okay. Um, so, look, there um, are a couple of um, strategies or action plans that have come out of Climate Action Joint Committees. Um, and so we've got one from Manawatu um, Whanganui and one from Te Tai Tokoro. Um, and I'm just going to give you... It's my take, so um, if I miss bits that you thought were cool or if you think I've missed the point entirely, this is just my perspective and I just want to highlight some stuff that's cool and potentially um, help, like, help to sort of give you some ideas of where you might take this committee. Um, so, so that's my disclaimer. Um, right. Okay, so um, I think it's kind of cool to know that we're not the only people setting up a climate action joint committee. Um, it turns out that they're kind of all over the place, so uh, and they're called the same thing. So Manawatu Whanganui and um, Te Tai Tokoro also have climate action joint committee, um, and I've just put in their membership to give you an idea of how they've set their committees up. So in um, Manawatu Whanganui, it's uh, eight councillors, so one from each of the councils, and seven, seven Tangata Whenua reps. Um, and they released their uh, action plan. So they they went with an action plan in early 2023. That's this year, earlier this year. Um, and in Te Tai Tokoro, um, they have four councillors, one from each of their councils, and four tangata whenua reps, and they released their strategy um, in April 2022. Basically, I'm sure you all know the difference between a strategy and an action plan, but I do think they get a little bit confused. The strategy from Te Tai Tokoro is... Um, it's far more detailed. There's a lot of background in there, a lot of explanation, um, and then there's actions, whereas the action plan um, is far more straight to actions, basically. That's, so it's a lot shorter. Um, but they are both quite long documents. Right. So I'm just going to do a bit of a comparison um, and highlight some of the similarities. Um, so from an inputs perspective, uh, both... Um, Joint committees or both plans look at um, what central government direction is. So there's a lot of legislative reform going on in this space, which makes it actually a very uncertain space to operate in. Like we're trying to make decisions at a council level while government are changing the the the, the play the, the Lego blocks, right? <laughs> like we're trying to build something, and they're like, no, let's take these ones away and change them. So, um, so they they talk about that, um, highlight that they both use climate risk assessments, and um, Tom is doing some really cool work, um, and I think that. Um, that work is basically a more dynamic version of the work that both of these um, groups have used um, in their uh, strategy to action plans. Um, they both talk about regional emissions, um, but Manawatu Whanganui have chosen to incorporate emissions into their action plan um, as part of the work that they're doing. Um, Te Tai Tokoro, they've done an adaptation strategy, so they've they've said it's important, they've said that they need to play a... They, that work needs to be part of the work that council do, but they've most, for the most part, separated it out from that strategy. Um, they both talk about engagement with Tangata Whenua, um, and um, so um, Te Tai Tokoro 
um, from memory, because I don't have my notes, um, they, uh, they just engaged with um, the Tangata Whenua reps on their council, and they oh, came back. Um, sorry, that screen just went black. Um, and they, um, they note that in their strategy as an area for improvement um, in their engagement. Um, Manawatu Whanganui, um, they engaged with... Um, they don't specify who they engage with, but they talk about engaging with Tangata Whenua and engaging with their youth councils, which is inspired. Um, so what a great place to be seeking um, feedback from. It's, it's, it's their future. Um, and then I know, it's not in their strategy, but I know from speaking to the person who wrote the strategy that in Te Tokoro they did, they did engage directly with at-risk communities and they had a lot of difficult conversations when they were creating their strategy. Um, all right, now this is... Um, Oh, looks pretty good on that screen. So this is just an example of something that's included within um, Te Tai Tokoro's um, in their strategy. Um, and I, um, it's actually, um, it's basically using the same sort of stuff that Tom was talking about um, and incorporating it into their strategy, right? So this is a map of um, Māori-owned land um, and um, and marae are all the little black triangles, and then the green is um, inundation, so where there's going to be like impacts from sea level rise, um, and then the pink is all the roads um, that are going to be um, impacted, and the, the, it's highlighting vulnerable, vulnerabilities, and particularly the impacts on more vulnerable communities, um, and so that's exactly the work that Tom doing, Tom's doing, is that, um, is that what what parts of the country are going to get cut off because, because the roads are down, even if the land itself might be fine, we might have no access into those communities. And that's obviously pretty um, close to home in the impact of Cyclone, after the impact of Cyclone Gabriel. Okay. And I just thought it was a really cool example of what, mm. how you can use that climate risk work in um, a strategy. Okay. They both talk about what our role as, as a council is um, in this space. So, um, so working constructively with central government and in Manawatu Whanganui, they really highlighted that resolving the funding issues. Who is paying for what? You know, let's, uh, you know it's not, it's not going to be all one or the other, but knowing who's going to be doing what is very important for us to make some of these decisions. Um, and both um, talked about, so in Te Tai Tokoro, they talked about how adaptation is necessarily local, how we need um, solutions that are for our communities, um, and they'll be different. So even if the risks are the same, the solutions are going to be different, and that's what makes council the right place for these conversations to be happening. And for so for council to be taking a leadership role in adaptation, potentially um, a diff in a different way from the role we play in emissions reduction. That's what they highlight in these, in the strategy and the plan. Mm. Um, okay. Um, so they both have kind of a priorities list that come out of their work, um, and I thought that there were some really um, important um, connections between what they're talking about. So empowering communities, growing relationships. They both talk about um, these difficult decisions to be made and difficult conversations to be had, and we, we know that firsthand. Um, and so the future um, and good outcomes in the future is going to be based on the relationships that we have um, and not shying away from those difficult conversations. Um, and I think Mayor Walker was talking about us all being on the same page in this committee and that, you know, extending that to the community. So talking about us all being on the same page. Um, Nature-based solutions. Um, addressing vulnerability, addressing known issues. So that's similar, like dealing with the stuff we already know about. And um, so the building capacity, uh, Te Tai Tokoro talk about um, employing more people into their climate change into their climate change team so that they have the capacity to deal with um, the impacts of climate change. All right. Connections. Um, so this is their focus. Where are they going? How are they, who are they connecting with? Why are they connecting with them? Um, so... Um, Manawatu Whanganui talk about engaging with youth as a priority, um, tangata whenua and community more broadly. Um, and they talk about like how they're going to resource that, focusing on like how, how do you resource engagement and making sure that's a priority. Um, they, yeah, so Te Tokoro, this is where they talk about um, 
the fact that their, that their um, engagement with tangata whenua has been limited to their committee and how important it is for partnership for that to be weaved through all of their adaptation planning. Um, they talk about adaptation pathways, um, which is the sort of work that we've done um, in the coastal hazards strategy, um, and community panels, so collaborative planning, working with our community directly, um, and that ties in again to some, in fact, I feel like Tom and I kind of, we must have just been in sync. Um, a lot of the stuff he said is um, very similar to what's in these, in these plans. Um, Again, it's not shying away from the difficult conversations. So in Te Tai Tokoro, they're talking about um, coastal communities, farming communities as a priority to have those conversations with. Um, and that investment in relationships and trust um, within the community is how we're gonna be able to make progress in the adaptation space. Um, so they both touch on emissions reduction and um, I thought it was important to to sort of talk about a little bit about, about their positions on that. Um, so I think they both are in the same space that um, emissions reduction, the expectation for them is that central government will set the direction and that um, local government will play a supporting role, um, that we are responsible for our own emissions and making sure that we're um, addressing those as a council, but also facilitating regional reductions. Um, and I think they both refer yeah, to regional emissions profiles. Um, the Manawatu Whanganui um, plan refers to, acknowledges the Regional Transport Committee and the important role that they play in that emission reduction space, so public transport, VKT reductions. Um, and in um, the action plan from Manawatu Whanganui, they, um, they actually have a page or two of actions for individuals, um, so things that anyone can do to be contributing. So I thought that was a really interesting um, thing to put in. Um, and they have actions that relate to emissions reduction in their action plan, but there's not as many as there are adaptation actions. Okay, so where to from here? Um, basically, um, this seems to be the direction that joint committees are taking um, and it's something for you to consider is whether we want to take a regional approach. Um, I mean, we do want to because we're all here, <laughs> uh, but how that looks for you as a committee. Um, these are meant to just be some examples of ways you might consider from a data perspective. Um, they used um, central government direction, risk assessments um, and emissions profile. We have all of that stuff. Um, well underway. Um, so um, from a data perspective, we're just in a much better place. Um, then um, talking about partnership and community engagement and the questions really about what that looks like um, here, um, the, that both the strategy and the action plan are, um, they're not desktop exercises, but they didn't do a lot of engagement. They've pushed the engagement out. So it's the next stage of their, of their work. Um, so whether, how that would look here, obviously up to you. Um, and I just really like the, you know, like this, this conversation about where do people sit on the spectrum of engagement? How much engagement do they need? Is it, is it different for at-risk communities versus the general public? Um, yeah, and that's all. Any questions? Kia ora. Thank you, Heather. Um, I think it's raised a lot more questions than answers. Well, that's a good thing. Though. <laughs> no, no, it does. Around around how we take this committee forward and what are our priority areas in terms of an action plan. Um, but I'll open it up, Zan. Oh, kia ora, Chair. Um, Heather, thanks very much for that. I mean, I, I have attempted to read both of those reports and they're quite long, and so to get your sense of this is very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, focus. The point, the main point I want to make today is, is focus to achieve actions. Mm. And I believe we should be focusing, the start point for us should be, and we get to it in the next paper, our regional share of the, a national, the NDC, a nationally determined contribution to, um, our, to sorry, what our, our greenhouse gas footprint is for the region and where it's going. So, and that goes to the core of, of our terms of reference in that we're, we're developing an emit, emissions reduction plan and we're setting targets, including interim targets. And I believe there'll be nothing more confronting than looking at our 2030 targets and having them up in headlights. So our 2030 target, what is our regional share 
of the 2030 NDC, and essentially it's a 50%, well, it's a 50% reduction of, the two, of our 2005 net to a 2000, sorry, gross, is it the other way around? So it's basically 2,000 50% less in rough terms uh, in 2030 from where we were at 20, 2005. And I don't know that we've got 2005 figures, but everything that we do know seems to suggest that um, we've been on the, that basically population growth and, 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 and GDP growth has been taking us on a slightly, um, you know, has been growing our footprint and, and what really matters, um, the big fluctuations are around our net, what's net going on in our forestry and maybe a little bit of what's happening in, in our stock numbers from a, a methane point of view. But to get back to my key point, we need action. We need action around and focus around where what levers we can pull, but also where the big wins possibly are. And, and the fact that, you know, in broad terms, if we're thinking about 50% in seven years, then just, with all due respect, um, you know, recycling, um, you know, um, vegetables, you know, putting in, a, you know, a click, collecting for all the good, collecting people's, you know, vegetable scraps in Napier or Hastings is not going to get us there. So we do have to not shy away from those difficult conversations. And those come to the fact that 67% of our regional footprint comes from agriculture and 20% comes from transport and 10% comes from stationary you know, <coughs> energy. These are, those are the highlights, the headlines that we have to confront. And, you know, we've heard from me, Alex and, and, and Tim and others about the challenges and the difficult conversations that we have to have. Well, I'm up for those difficult conversations. And I think we, we can't shy away from those. And there's an opportunity and it links in to our recovery. There's plenty of opportunity and, and, and you know, it'd be great to have Wara around the table for this conversation because there's no one that gets it better in this virtual room than, than Mayor Craig. The challenge around finding the right place for, you know, for agriculture and for trees in our landscape. And that's, that's part of the regional council coal popper, mm -hmm. but it's it's what it's one of the central things that we have to grapple with if we're going to hit that 2030 number. So anyway, I've, I've probably said enough, but my my proposition is that we focus really hard on some very clear targets, and they will become compelling mm -hmm. because this is a climate emergency. We're not stuffing around. We this is not getting around for fun. This is not just reports. It's action. Thank you. Kilda then. Yeah. Ready? Yeah, and thank you. Um, just one thing with engagement, education, I think, is one of the most vital things that, particularly in the waste area, um, and for a lot of the low hanging fruit, it's just about people understanding what they can do, as you said, Heather, bit by bit, one by one, one thing at a time, you know? Now, I just don't think we're putting enough emphasis on educating people to understand how easy or you know, simple we could make this for them in their own homes. This is part of the community engagement. I think that's a big, big picture discussion. Green, Kilda, and then yeah, I just wanted to speak um, in Totoku what um, what Zan said. I think you know I'd written down when I was watching your, your presentation. You know, we need a priority to focus on practical recommendations. That's mm -hmm. what we're here to do. The you know we are the climate action uh, committee, so we need to be really focused on that action, and we need to give priority to it. You know, if we at the end of this in a year's time have a beautiful glossy strategy that talks about engagement and talks about building trust and relationships and um, you know all of that stuff, we're not actually doing. We're not giving people tools that tell, you know, I love the action plan stuff that you talked about up there, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we should focus on, and, and we should prioritise that. There are, you know, so many things and so many deep dive and rabbit holes we could get down in this space. You talk about climate change, and man, is it a sphere from, you know, it's a big spectrum, mm -hmm. but we're here, we're here to do this, and we can be mindful of the rest of it, but we need to be really focused, so I just support what Sam was saying. Kilda. Uh, Mare. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Heather. <clears throat> I guess um, when the Hawke's Bay Regional Council declared 
um, the climate emergency in June 2019. I guess um, since then, three of the five councils have appointed a small portion of uh, of uh, one FTE to focus on climate change in some form. You know, and when we think about what occurred this year um, in terms of the cyclone, and of course you need to just sum all of that up when all of the national emergency um, came in, um, our our civil defence emergency team taken over, and that um, what then came out of our communities, particularly in Omaha, they didn't wait around. They just got on with the job in terms of one, having to get through both the recovery into the welfare and, of course, their position, along with Waiohiki and, and, and other marae that were heavily impacted by all of this disruption. And that um, from, from, from having to ensure that these sorts of processes that we've got going on, um, we sit in the middle of both the well-being of our communities, the well-being of the tai of the environment, and of course, local authorities, central government. That's why it's really, really important that I put a voice to this all. When we put our, and so prior to the event, 14th February, um, our team here had been working on emergency planning uh, for our marae. Uh, for over a year, and it just got right up to the point where we were about to engage in on training. So we did the education thing to inform our community at best in so far as let's get ready. And then came right up to that event when we were just about to start this training. And, and of course, damn, it just hit where it couldn't have hit at the worst time. What I'm, what I'm alluding to here is that... Um, so we put our own skin in the game, and like many other communities, um, when we made submission to the National Climate Change Adaption Submission Process, I want to be clear about this, not only were we advocating for, of course, the role of Hooks Bay Regional Council, but for other organisations that are in this space as well, Hooks Bay Environmental Centre, um, and, you know, some parts of our Tai Whenua, um, having this type of response. And so I guess we're advocating in the way by which um, when it comes to equity around uh, community organisations, and we made this quite clear in our submissions that we've got iwi, PSGE, Tai Whenua, um, and we need to just grow on the work that we are all doing because we can't just leave it all up to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the whole strategy here is about collective collaboration. And if we've got that reach back down into our own respective communities, I mean, this has got to be really, really fundamental. I read through both those two documents um, to just go straight into where <coughs> the narrative around Māori um, set. And, you know, got to give hands up, hands down, I mean, to our Taitukaro whānau. Um, I thought they had a, and thanks Heather for that lovely descriptor in terms of what each analysis came from each of those particular documents and and I, I can't underpin loudly enough in terms of how our Tai Tukaro whānau, um, albeit that they've got to go through um, a, a, you know, a, a, a process uh, which takes their hapu along but there's footnotes that actually say that while they're around the table as we are right now we represent a much wider fold of people back out in our communities. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there in terms of also support those groups that are out there proactive in making sure that both pre and post emergency, we're getting our people ready, we're educating our people at the same time. One other thing before I wrap up is that I'm not sure whether or not in our strategy, we've, we've actually got to focus on while we talk about emissions, um, also about, and it's only like um, um, in terms of renewable energy and how that plays itself out. Um, as uh, you know, we've got a total reliance on other kind of carbon footprint type energy um, contributions. I think that we also need to be looking at renewable energy as well. Kia ora. Kia ora Are there any other comments? Hayley. Yeah, kia ora. Um, was a great presentation, Heather. And um, one thing that I was making notes on is I'm really excited to see what um, 
what sort of work needs to be done out there? And of that, what is within council's sphere of control? And what is sort of more behavioural preferences or habits within the community? And then thinking about what sort of role this, uh, this committee is going to play um, in, in shifting those habits. Because um, I suppose there's, there's both the habits um, like Mare was talking about with preparedness for adaptation, but also um, habits that are detrimental to the environment and how we get people to stop driving long k's in their cars, for example. Um, but I love this slide and I'm excited to be more in the blue around empowering people. Mm -hmm. And I think potentially this co uh, committee has the role of um, inspiring the community for what actions they can take, like in that document you were talking about, but then also having a role around removing the barriers that those people have when they want to, like they've got the inspiration, they want to change, but there's some barriers. So if we can be a, a barrier removing committee, that would be kind of cool too. Hi, kia ora. Thank you for everyone's input. And um, have you got some takeaways from that? We carbon emission reduction, um, empowerment, um, down to communities, um, and have some clear targets that we're aiming for. Um, and it sounded like you you liked the um, the action plan sort of focus. That action. that was very much the, more yeah. the action than yeah. the strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And look, okay. what sphere those actions sit within? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the collaborative action, which Mare spoke to beautifully, which is absolutely right. What do, how do we empower what people are already doing to contribute and create that snowball of impact? Mm. Yeah. So, so taking that on board um, and just having a thought about how we discuss that further in the next committee meeting, I think would be really useful because we're starting to really focus and prioritise, which is great because that's what we want to do here, um, to look at those action points. Yeah. Couple. Then. So, thank you, Chair. Just want to um, suggest an, an addition to that um, that diagram, and it's advocate. And you know, we have a great opportunity. And one of the things, and whilst we can look at the narrow-ish roles that each contributing council has and the constraints there, if we only look at that, then we miss the opportunity to advocate at a national level. Mm. Or change that helps us get our region where once once it needs to get, and I think particularly in the agriculture space. So if you look at, the, at where most of our emissions are, some of our greatest opportunities, you know, the the key to success of those is effective advocacy. So I don't, I, I think that is should be within our ambit. Mm -hmm. um, can I so? Would that, in your view, involve things like us as a tag, um, writing submissions for um, to bring to you for pieces of legislation or sitting in that sort of space, feeding into central government? In my mind, it's more about uh, attracting investment into the region and that projects happen? that make change on the ground. I, I don't mm -hmm. want you to... I don't want to instruct you to... I'd, ra I'd rather... It's about action. Mm -hmm. It's about okay, action yeah. around projects that actually reduce our emissions. Sometimes it will be policy change that, that is required. For example, ETS, <laughs> for example, that might be a role to say, for us to say in, in one way or another, we need the ETS to change in this particular direction, otherwise we can't achieve what we need to as a, as a region. And by the way, that's a microcosm of the national problem. But we are in a special place at the moment. We have a special voice and special experience through the cyclone. Mm. and an insight that can inform national direction. Mm. It, um, is that actions like over the weekend we all heard about New Zealand Steel being transitioned to renewable energy, which in one hit is going to reduce our national emissions by 1%, by almost mm. a million tonnes. Yeah. 2%? 2%? Mm. 800,000 tonnes or 80 million mm. tonnes? Okay. Um, so we have a plant at Whirinaki, a power generation plant, that burns diesel. That's how we generate our energy from that plant. Now that plant increased over the last few years and increased tenfold the emissions coming from that plant because we had droughts, which mean lower lake levels, which mean less hydro. So we rely. So we have a, you know an equivalent that if we were to transition that one plant in one hit, that's a really big win. So is that the kind of action that? It's absolutely, the kind of thing mm -hmm. I have in mind. Absolutely. And it comes back to where. 
We're, the big number, 50% of a big number is, is the reduction we're looking for. And so we need big ideas mm. and big actions to achieve mm. that. And advocate for that. And advocacy. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Because we can't do it just with our own resources in the region. No, I, I'm actually not. pleased that that got to that, to something that was regionally relevant, because yeah. when you talked about needing advocacy, that's where I was thinking, even just with our regional transport committee mm. and HBRC, about what's the really strong advocacy from this group that says actually the funding of the public transport plan that's been mooted and actually just needs to get on and expand public transport and promotion of active transport. Mm -hmm. But what is the within region advocacy to get that yeah. really powerfully moving forward um, is, a, is another place as well, because that's immediately about um, carbon reduction too. Yeah. I think what might be helpful of some of those projects or committees within Hawke's Bay, if you do get one of that as a policy team to sort of bring some of that feedback here, because although I'm not on the transport committee and I do hear bits and pieces, it's actually really helpful to understand what some other committees are doing in this uh, reduction space. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on to our guest speaker, next guest speaker, Kapai? Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Great feedback. Um, so we are moving on to uh, the World Weather Attribution Study on Cyclone Gabriel. And we have our guest speaker, um, Dr. Sam. Sam Dean. Kia ora from Niwa. Kia ora, Sam. Kia ora. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you very well. And I'm um, sorry about the delay. We're having some robust discussion there, which I'm sure you, 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 you were listening in on. <laughs> Come on. I, I, thought it, I thought it was wonderful discussion. I almost feel like I should just like not speak and you should just carry on. Because <laughs> oh, no, no, you've got some you, great information to share with us, Sam. It you're right in, the, right in the middle of really good ideas and really tough conversations and right at the coalface of climate change. Um, and I guess I'm going to... Um, you okay if I, shall I just share my screen? Yeah, Sam? absolutely. Yeah. And just a little bit about you, um, Sam, before you kick off, so um, we get some context to um, the information you're sharing with us today. Great, sure. Um, I'm Sam Dean. I'm based in Wellington. Uh, I am a Principal Climate Scientist at NIWA. I was our Chief Scientist in Climate for a, a few years previously, and now I'm back being a, an active scientist. Uh, I served on the government's Adaptation Technical Working Group um, back under the national government that kicked off a whole lot of uh, adaptation work. And I have a also played a strong role in producing climate projections for New Zealand over um, 15, 16 years now. Um, I've also, as part of my work, looked at understanding how climate change is affecting extreme events uh, now, not just about how the future will change. Um, as an important part of the, that's been an important part of the conversation with New Zealanders, I think, to understand that climate change isn't some big scary thing for the future, that it's kind of a big scary thing right now already, as you know, maybe you're, you're already aware, um, at more than anyone else perhaps, but it's uh, that brings the something real, uh, talking about the scary distant future is disengaging for people, um, talking about the now and what you are going to do now and what you, you know, coming up with tangible actions that will allow you to proceed is um, important. Sorry, I'm wandering off in a different conversation. We could talk about um, carbon accounting now. Um, I have an opinion on everything, so I'll try and restrict myself. Um, we, I've been invited to talk about the, uh, this, and I'll be quick. You know, New Zealand's changed, right? No question. Uh, average temperature's gone up record near record te high temperatures all the time, record breaking extreme rainfall and flooding in New Zealand is unquestionable. The statistics are quite clear that we are experiencing um, increasing extreme rainfall and weather much like much of the world. But some climate scientists would say it's no point in worrying about exactly how much because uh, everything has changed and we live now live on a different planet from that which existed 150 years ago and there's some point to that, but I myself have been quite interested in trying to understand uh, 
more usefully how climate change is affecting um, New Zealand. And I also spend a lot of my time looking at natural variability, which is a significant driver of rainfall extremes in New Zealand. Um, and the climate skeptics forget that that's actually the harder part of my job, whereas the climate change bit is much simpler compared to understanding natural variability. Uh, apologies, Sam. Um, I'll just, can I just pause there? We can't see your presentation. Have you got it up on your screen? Um, luckily, I haven't actually like changed any slides, so I just waffled on. <laughs> oh, great. We can um, see it. Tanya, can you see it? Tanya Hotmans? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Sorry, I hadn't actually shared it, but there wasn't anything. <laughs> it's just the words, isn't it, that I said. So, um, in this recently, we did a rapid attribution study and we found that Gabrielle was 30% more intense and four times more likely. So, that's like if you're going from a one in 100 year storm to a one in 25 year storm. So, what used to be a one in 100 year storm is now a one in 25 year storm. I think that number's too high. Um, I think it's an outcome of the rapidness of the study, and I will talk a little bit about why I think it's more like 8% and twice as likely. But for all intents and purposes, you know, whether it's two or four is a big deal, but equally it's not a question of whether there's climate change or not. I've been doing this a long time. My first work on was a event in December 2011 in Golden Bay where um, my family has a holiday home and where we saw six more than 600 millimetres, like 700 millimetres in 48 hours um, at the coast, so at sea level. Um, so while we saw like quite extraordinary amounts of rainfall in Hawke's Bay and high elevations generally, um, this was right at the coast at low elevations and it was, it was um, extremely unusual and caused um, quite devastation in an area that's not very populated though. So, but it was a, a significant event. And since then, since about 2015, this is just, you know, we've just gone through a sequence of a lot of floods in New Zealand um, after some relatively quiet period. We're now seeing a lot of quite significant flooding events, some of which is likely to be nat due to natural variability and some of which is likely enhanced by climate change. Uh, in the Cycle and Gabrielle, we, this is an animation of the rainfall that occurred. I just put this up because it took me and Trevor a lot of time to try and make this figure because we still don't have enough rainfall stations um, at high elevations to understand exactly how much rain fell. But we've used um, various weather models and all the gauges from the Hawke's Bay and Gisborne Regional Councils and NEWAS gauges and every gauge we could get our hands on to try and um, make this map where you, you, you see up to 600 millimetres in 24 hours occurring in a lot of the hills in the region and that, you know, is, that causes devastating flooding, of course. Um, and we know this, we've run this through our flood models, so we know it's about the right amount of water. I'm going to skip over the return period plot, but it's just to point out that in some locations, this is a very, very rare event and other places not very rare at all. Um, that just shows how when you have a storm, some places, somewhere is going to break its record, right? So somewhere, there's always a randomness to where the really extreme locations get hit. But these are the, these are, this is a plot of um, council gauges. So it's all the Hawke's Bay Regional Council rainfall gauges. Hey, Sam, um, with just some... interrupt? Because um, that um, uh, what you, pictorial, that an animation was incredible. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you flipped through it really quickly. But I've never it again? seen it presented that way, which is actually amazing. So I don't want to, yeah, I, I don't want to do belittle it. it. Can you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> One before that too. Yeah, yeah, both of them. So you. And is this this the rainfall before the gauges stop working? Because uh, they stopped working somewhere, didn't they? Yeah. No. Well, afterwards, most of them, the data was there. Um, we managed to recover it. Yeah. So once we got it, once the council oh, got it, it was, recovered. It was yeah. Yeah. Um, recovered. I was told this was, it was gone. Oh, yeah. The telecommunications no. to bring the data back yeah. was okay. gone. But so it was, it was all stored on the on the local hard drives on the on the gauges. Yeah, so yeah. We, we could get them back. And so this is mostly coming from the yeah from the council gauges, um, but it's using a weather model, the NEWAS weather model, to try and figure out. If, if you've got this much rainfall in the gauges that we have, what must be falling in the hills, right? So we don't have measurements at the top of these hills where these numbers are coming out. 
these peaks, these peak rainfalls occur in the hills in an unmeasured fashion. Um, we, you kind of, you can have river flow gauges which will tell you something about how much rainfall is coming up from the hills, but um, this is based on rainfall gauges plus uh, dynamical weather forecasting models to produce an actual estimate of. And we then have run this through our flood models to produce a flood map for the entire region, which tells us that we need this much water to make the to make it all work as it actually happened. Mm. Um, so you've got yeah 621 millimeters. You get up to 500 millimeters in most places at the peaks. Mm. Uh, Kathleen, we've got um, Dr. Kathleen here. Do you have access to this data and I'm, this modelling? No, no. So Kathleen, I think Trevor sent you this as an as a NetCDF file, not as an animation like this. Yeah. Um, so you have the. I think just the one image. She's just got the one image, but yeah. Uh, well, okay. Kathleen is welcome to have this data okay. as on this grid. It's very good for the flood modelling. There's no perfect. Kathleen, I'll send it to you after this. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, and it's really what to get the sort of blood modeling right. This is what you need, right? You can't just stick um, you, getting station data alone, when especially um, doesn't tell you the whole story. And this is probably our best our best estimate of what what happened. And this is exceptionally a large amount of water, right? It's um, it's pretty big. Mm. And in some places, the return period on that is hundreds of years. Um, for the region as a whole, it depends what you, you know, it depends how you do the analysis uh, and whether you account for climate change. And it, it could be anything between a 10 and 90 year event as a regional, at a region wide Gisborne and Hawke's Bay. Um, depending on how you do that analysis, it's really uncertain. You see, we're, there's far too much to talk about here. Um, this is. Just to say that this on the left there is is the summer rainfall anomaly that occurred. So that's the whole summer for the whole country, right? Um, for December, January, February. This is what a La Nina, all the previous La Ninas on average look like for the country, and this is what our Ninos look like. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're all very aware of this, but what we see is a spatial pattern of rainfall that looks exactly like you, what you would expect for a La Nina year. And so much so that in November of 2022, this is what the this is what the seasonal Niwa seasonal climate outlook said. Um, in connection with La Nina, warmer than average seas in the southwest Pacific are expected to fuel frequent low pressure systems. Some of which will drop down into New Zealand, bringing the risk for occasional heavy rain and flooding, similar to what was experienced in last summer. So clearly, the last bit is, didn't quite work out because it was much worse than last summer. But um, the point is it wasn't entirely unexpected that we would see such wet conditions in the Hawke's Bay and our seasonal out outlooks pick that up. And it's because we had this strong La Nina with these warm sea surface temperatures. And this is what happens in those kind of years. Um, it increases the likelihood of an ex-tropical cyclone as well. Um, it more than doubles the risk when you've got a La Nina like that. Uh, the study that found the, the rapid study um, is based on the fact that in the observations, so if we look at this graph here, where we've got rainfall, 48 hour, um, oh, it's called RX2 day, but it's a 48 hour accumulation um, from 1979 to 2023, averaged over the entire region um, for a particular observed product, has a positive trend in it. Um, and if you assume that that positive trend is associated with climate change, then you get this estimate of 30% more intense and four times more likely due to the fact that the world is warmed by 1.2 degrees. Uh, we did, we also use climate models as well as observations. Uh, I mostly work with climate models. I work with climate models and observations. Our climate models did not give us uh, the same result. Our climate models suggested more likely that the variability is too high to, or either the models are wrong or the models um, suggest the variability is too high for to make any sort of um, assessment on that on such a short record. And something that wasn't in the in the in the um, 
report, but which I think is really important, is I have now plotted up the manual records have come in. So NIWA has manual records that go back to the 1880s, uh, where in particular farms, um, where these measurements are taken manually and then posted in, and then they come in about a month later, and then they get added into the climate database. And so these are two very long records in the Hawke's Bay region at Guavis, uh, and which is in, well, I guess, um, near Havelock North no. somewhere. <laughs> away from um, a little, you're a little bit out there. Um, yeah, Havelock. <laughs> Sorry. It's yeah. the yeah. northwestern part of Central Hawke's Bay district. Yeah. <laughs> yep, there we go. I have to admit, I, 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 not a, it's like a, yeah. <laughs> is it a Welsh word or something, is it? Like, anyway. <laughs> nice thing. <laughs> um, it's got a very long record back to 1880, right? So that's your day. These are daily. These are from the daily records. These are 48 hour accumulations like that study. Um, an accumulated precipitation over 48 hours from 1880 through to 2023, including the event which sits here. So that's the amount of rain that was measured at that station relative to the past. So for that, it's the biggest since 1979. But there are previous, there are a, number, a few events bigger than that. This is the Eskdale. It did not, unsurprisingly, perhaps take measurements during the event. Um, They're probably a little busy with other things. Uh, so I've made an estimate there based on a neighboring Taradale site and um, that's just a relationship between the two, so it's just it's just an estimate, just to note that. But um, this is uh, again back in the 1920s. You saw something similar and uh, another major event at this location in the you know in the 1938 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main point of these figures is that there is significant decadal variability in rainfall extremes in this region, as you're probably all aware. Both these locations pick up this positive trend over the last few years, and that was sort of noted in the study that, you know, there are a number of stations, most stations show this positive trend, um, but some do not. And the main point of this figure is that that trend through there, you know, you could, if you started that trend in 1970, you would say there's no trend. And if you start it in 1979, there's a positive trend. And if you started it in 1920, it would be a negative trend. So th that just points to the fact that there's significant decadal variability in rainfall extremes in this region. Um, and there's a bit of a bimodal population, sorry, there's kind of a population of storms where the really big ones are all extropical cyclones, as far as I'm aware, um, and they'll be slow-moving extropical cyclones, which you know run aground on a blocking high. So, those are relatively rare occurrences. These sort of everyday um, annual maxima. So these are the annual maxima. So the biggest 48-hour total in every year, right? Sorry, I should have said that. These are the biggest 48-hour totals in each year. So it's the biggest event that occurred in each of those years. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So what we what we do see is that the sea surface temperatures in around New Zealand in the last few years with these extreme rainfalls have been really high and they play a strong role in fueling these and climate change has contributed to those warm SSTs. I, I really like this figure. You probably haven't seen it. It's the sea surface temperatures around New Zealand on the 6th of February. Um, and on the right on the 15th of February after Gabrielle has come through. So Gabrielle is fueling um, from the warm SSTs in the sub. These are, these are anomalies. So it's the temperature relative to normal. So these temperatures are higher than normal particularly around New Zealand, but also in the tropics here. This is a very La Nina signature of warm SSTs in the South Pacific, um, in the formation region of these extropical cyclones with warm SSTs over the entire track of the cyclone. And these cyclone feeds on this warm SST and that keeps it alive all the way down to New Zealand. And this afterwards, all the heat has been, the mixing of the ocean and the heat exchange to the atmosphere has totally made these waters much colder than normal. And that's just exclusively caused by 
uh, the cyclone going past. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Hawke's Bay wearing the brunt of all that energy being sucked up out of the ocean. <coughs> so we ha the point of my, the natural variability makes understanding how climate change has influenced extreme rainfall in Hawke's Bay from observations alone almost impossible. Um, and so that study is probably far too high in its estimate. Um, when we use the climate, when I use the climate models that I have done used for previous studies where we, you know, these climate models are capable of simulating the weather, we validate them. In this case, we use a climate models that here in this additional piece of work that wasn't in the report that we've done subsequently where we look at thousands of years of simulations so that we can account for natural variability. Um, and we include simulations with all our greenhouse gas emissions and without all our greenhouse gas emissions. And this is just what happens for temperature if you simulations with greenhouse gases and without greenhouse gases, and that's how you get the 1.1 degree difference between those with and those without. We can look at the rainfall in Hawke's Bay for, the, for a 1 in 100 year event or so, um, like Gabrielle, and we, in that case, we see an intensity increase of 8%. If you don't believe in climate models, then uh, then you're kind of stuck. I obviously am a great believer in the basic of climate models is their ability to capture the basic physics of the climate system. They're exactly the same thing that, you know, is used for weather forecasting. Um, and I've spent my entire research career on them. So of course, I'm a great believer in these models, but that they're really the only way these, these sort of, the, to create an experimental situation where you have a world without greenhouse gases so that you can compare your world with that we now have to the world that we might have had if we hadn't embarked on this crazy experiment. And that comes out at an intensity of 8% and a um, 1.8 to 2 times more likely. So you're kind of going from 1 in 100 to 1 in 50 years. Um, just to finish, and, and I think that's more defensible than the study, it's also consistent with what we sort of our guidance and the MFE guidance around extreme rainfall and climate projections. So uh, there is a reason why though extropical cyclones are a, a sort of special thing that all of this, what I've talked about is about sort of these usual extreme annual maxima storm in the Hawke's Bay, some of which are extropical cyclones, some of which aren't. We don't have good studies for just extropical cyclones in New Zealand. They don't, the one that moves past slow enough to do lots of damage is relatively rare. And they, um, they have always, they're difficult to model um, because of their severity and there aren't a lot of observations of them to analyze them through observations. So it is likely that tropical cyclones based on overseas studies are more, you know, have a, are probably higher in terms of how they're being affected by climate change. But for instance, we have no expectation that extropical cyclones will increase in frequency under climate change. There's all sorts of things that go on that stop them increasing in frequency. But we, those change in the SSTs that like with the warm ocean waters coming closer to New Zealand means that they're more likely to get um, closer to the country before they undergo their transition to an extropical system rather than a tropical cyclone. Uh, and just a little figure that's from the latest CMIP 6 climate global projections for New Zealand, which is not yet out, but which New Niwa is working on. Um, and this plot is annual mean temperature on the X on the Y on the side there and years from 2020 out to 2100. So it's a projection done in 2018. And it just is showing you that these different colored lines there are the ensemble mean climate projections into the future of different emission scenarios. So one's the, the, like the yellow one where we have strong mitigation and we um, uh, stay below two degrees. Uh, and other ones where like the high ones are SSP 585, where we burn all the coal we can find and more. Um, and the point of this figure is that 
those emissions trajectories and our mitigation efforts determine our long-term future. Like there is a big difference between three degrees of warming and half a degree of warming between these yellow and blue lines above our current state. But out to, out to 2045, those mitigation pathways, realistic mitigation pathways, make no difference to the warming that we will observe in New Zealand. There is uh, enough momentum and ongoing emissions, even on a even on a carbon zero by 2050 pathway, that we will warm by another 0 0.7 degrees um, to 2045 where we've warmed 1.1 degrees, 1.2 degrees so far, and we've got another 0.7 to go regardless. So we'll, that would be 1.9 degrees. There is no chance of staying under 1.5 degrees. Um, there is a chance of staying under two degrees with climate action, but adaptation is going to remain um, important and expensive. Uh, and that's just a summary of, this, of, of what I said in the first place. Uh, Great. Sorry it took so long. No, no, that was fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Um, I know from our Hawke's Bay Regional Council perspective, we haven't had uh, the opportunity uh, for a presentation like that. Um, so really impressive, and thank you for sharing that uh, with us and also our team for bringing you on and thinking that actually this is great timing for us. Um, to explore uh, where we're going as a committee. So I'll open it up for questions or comments for Sam. Thank you, Anne. It's, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but I'm just interested in the timelines. They seem to be 50 years and 100 years for the worst events. Is that a thing? <laughs> Sam? Timelines? Well, periods. I mean... The, the, we often talk about the one in 50 year or the one in 100 year f events just because of the the basis in planning. So lots of the building code and stuff to the one in 50 year time frame. Um, the, I used a one in 100 year in this presentation as a representation of what Gabrielle might be, although it's probably somewhere in the 30 to 40 year, one in 30 to 40 year event is the best guess of what that, you know, you, you get an ex tropical cyclone bringing that much rain to Hawke's Bay about once every 30 to 40 years on average. I guess what I was thinking about, Sam, was 2024 was a huge rain event and a lot of flooding, 2074, three big floods in Hawke's Bay, 2023. So I'm looking at the actual periods between, just wondering if that's something that's common. So while you say one in 50, one in 100, they actually are by the looks of your graphs. You mean the historical station observations? Yes. Mm. Um, yeah, you, you're getting these You're getting the big extropical cyclone events once every 40 or 50, 30, 40, 40, 50 years. Mm. Absolutely. That's, you had Bowler, there was one in 1961, uh, February 1961, an extropical cyclone without a name. Um, they, that's roughly how frequently they damaged the Hawke's Bay, Gisborne region severely. Um, the climate change makes that, you know, if, if you think the normal climate's one in 40 years, then maybe it's making it a bit more like one in 20 years. Um, so it should happen more often if we keep heating the planet. Mm, yeah. But you've got this really complicated set of things. You've got to get this, ex you've got to get a tropical cyclone. You've got to get it coming down to New Zealand. You've got to get it running aground against a large high in the right place. You've got all these big events like Golden Bay and the Bay of Plenty and Hawke's Bay, these big blocking highs east of the country are a large part of the story of why they do so much damage when they run aground and just pump water in continuously to one place. Thanks, uh, Kia ora, Tanya. <coughs> oh. Kia ora, Sam. That was awesome. I really enjoyed your kōrero. Um, I 
wanted to ask two questions. The first one was, um, I noticed on the Guavas and ESC, you know, pictures that you had, where you'd yeah. made an estimate of what this latest cyclone um, might have measured um, yeah. in the upward trend there. Um, we have some evidence from some of our whānau from 1938 Anzac Day flood um, based in Tang Oil, which is just around the corner from the ESC, and they talked about nine feet of silt in the valley, which sounds crazy, but, you know, that's what they were saying. We didn't get that amount of silt, and I'm sure there's all sorts of variables that might have resulted in that at that given time. But it did make me wonder whether this... Um, latest flood is the worst that we could see and uh, your measurements there or your graphs there would sort of indicate it is up there in terms of the worst we could see but do you think it is oh that's a great question <laughs> uh, you're recorded by the way now <laughs> averaged across gisborne and hawke's bay i don't think it's the worst i actually think cyclone bowler was bigger, uh, but not in the Hawke's Bay. Mm -hmm. So in the Hawke's Bay, uh, Cyclone Bola is not such a big event, but for Gisborne, it's a massive event. Um, when I look at the rainfall of the two averaged across the whole region, then uh, Bowler is slightly larger. Um, but every time you get hit by one of these, and this is a really important point, the different, there's not, there's not one, we have a bit of a I think back to Auckland where a few years ago we had flash flooding in the Hurunui. So we went through a whole process of trying to put an early warning system in on that catchment. And at the time I said, the fact that it's that catchment is nothing special. That's just the luck of that storm hitting that catchment. And next time it'll be somewhere else. Mm. And this time it was somewhere else. And so there is always going to be places that see more rainfall than they've ever seen before. I'm sure there is somewhere, one of those stations, Kathleen would know better than me, that broke its all-time record. I know the Terradale record is far above anything ever seen there back over the last 60 years. Um, so there are some locations that unquestionably broke their record. There are lots of places that did not. As as a, it, it was not an earth, it was not a like category five tropical cyclone. It was only a category three. It went slow moving. It was not out of this planet storm, never before seen can't imagine how this could possibly happen. It is right. definitely a plausible storm to occur in this region, given the records that we have over the, but with a long return period, like 40, 50 years to out to 80 years, maybe that might not, it might be, you have to go back to the 1928 to get something that was for Hawke's Bay as big as that. But Thank Hawke's you. Bay, nine, some places in 90, some places in the region, would have had much more rain in 1928 than in this one. Kapai, thank you. And my second question was, um, it may not be one that you can answer, but I've been asking the question, you know, and you mentioned being able to have warnings. Um, we know that the predicted rainfall in some places was actually only half of what fell. So twice, twice more of the rainfall actually fell. Why why do the predictions not match the actual? Ah, well, okay. So you want this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, th there is a problem with the way you do flood modelling um, in that you're always going to see when you do these weather forecasts, there, you always kind of get this ensemble of forecasts. And so the Niwa, like I know the Niwa weather one, some of those forecasts produce just as much rain as actually happened. Other ones don't produce as much. And the Met Services ones certainly don't produce as much. But you also have a problem that when you do river flow modeling, if you're using stations and you've calibrated your river model to a station and then you input a single number into that station, you're not sampling the uncertainty in those forecasts very well. So I don't think we do a good job of, in any regional of New Zealand, of accounting for 
the uncertainty in those forecasts. So considering that there's space, you know, you don't quite, the models are not good enough to get exactly where the most rain is going to fall. Mm -hmm. They could fall in the neighbouring catchment in that model. And it, it, I would consider that a brilliant forecast that it got 600 millimetres in the neighbouring catchment. Mm -hmm. But if you just took it as what actually fell in that catchment and it's too low, right? So you actually got to understand that that imperfection in the forecasting and grapple with that uncertainty in a really robust way. And I think every council in New Zealand could do a better job of grappling with how to use forecast uncertainty in uh, their, their hydrological river flow forecasts that they then do with those forecasting inputs. Having said that, I've been working in this for 20 years. I'm well known as a strongly opinionated, outspoken individual. <laughs> so um, we're straying, we're straying into my like reckless. Uh, don't don't take this as Niwa's like official position on anything. <laughs> this is just slowly back me, <laughs> me being the loose cannon that I always am. So I do. We're not making the most of the information we have. Mm -hmm. I actually think we that, that ex-tropical cyclone was exceptionally well forecast uh, 12 days in advance mm -hmm. with those with amounts of rainfall comparable to what actually fell. And we, <coughs> having said that, the Auckland events were completely unforecast. No forecast system picked up what would happen in Auckland in that sort of four hours of, un, you know, of gargantuan rainfall in a, mm. in a thunderstorm convective training process that is really hard for the models to do. So good, good on the models, but also there are still lots of problems with forecast systems as well. So in which case, what can you do? Kia ora, thank, thank you. But I do, there's a point that it. if we were, if we really understood our long-term history, of the region, if we were adapted and mm -hmm. understood really well what just are based on our historical records, we would go a long way to be ready ready for climate change, right? Mm -hmm. There are these um, these knowledge both from these rainfall records, but also from uh, local people about what can really happen in these places and. I don't think we're really prepared for what really can happen in these places with or without climate change. Yeah. Kia ora, Sam. We've got one more question from Zan. Kia ora, Chair. <coughs> Sam, that was both enlightening and hugely entertaining as well. So <laughs> good on <laughs> you for uh, making a, a highlight of the afternoon. Look, you might just have answered it, but my question is, is around casting forwards to, let's say, 2045 in, in the graph that you had, and to what extent we should be thinking as a council about factoring in the best estimate we can of that additional uh, risk and additional volume of rainfall for our flood protection. So we're right at, at the beginning of a journey towards rethinking our flood protection, and we'll be rebuilding assets with a view out to around about 2045, 2050. So have you got any gems for us, either in terms of numbers or a process to think about whether, and if so, how much we factor in for climate change over that time? Thank you. So I think that I don't yet, there's lots of uncertainties around climate change because it's a great big experiment with the planet that we don't really know the outcome, but I, I have no evidence to suggest that the MFE guidance is wrong at this point, that factoring in those, the numbers that are in there, they're, they're about 8% per degree, depending on your duration, is the appropriate thing to do, given the scientific evidence that we have. Um, on top of that, you do have a particular, you obviously have in Hawke's Bay, you know, periods of much greater flooding activity and lesser flooding activity. And you could have a decade now of severe floods driven by a combination of natural variability and climate change that uh, could be really not very pleasant. Um, <laughs> so how you, the, the uniqueness of that, that interplay of the fact that, because we, I spent from, after the Manawa 2 floods in 2004, we were going to have an MPS for flooding, right? And no, then just no floods happened. So we went 15 years and 10 years and there basically was, well, that's not quite true, but there was a real it was really bad for flood researchers because there was a 
dearth of flooding and maybe it lulled us into a sense of false security a little bit. And then the last six years, we've been really active with flooding around the country. And I don't know how long that's going to last and it could go away tomorrow and that wouldn't mean climate change is gone, but it could it could equally go on for 10 years and then be relatively quiet in the 2040s. Um, that's the compl complication. Uh, if you want to adapt to what could happen versus if you just want to consider how do we build climate change on top of the defences we already have and where that's going to be adequate or where it might not be adequate. I, hopefully I've conveyed a little bit of how complicated this problem is um, <laughs> and I'm sure the people in your council like Kathleen really understand this, the councils really un do understand this quite well being very local um, and you've got a very local experience. Kia ora Sam, hey thank you. For Sorry that wasn't a very good answer. No, no, that's okay. It just shows the complexity of it all. Um, so thank you, Sam, so much for joining us. Um, that was a great presentation, great discussion, um, and hopefully we'll see you again um, at some stage uh, to present further with, with anything our team uh, wants to bring to the committee. So thank you so much. Um, Anytime. I just wanted to say thank you. And actually, in all my years, this is the first time any uh, council I've I've has actually asked me to talk to them. So you're like leading the charge. And, uh, <laughs> and I, your climate action group is a wonderful idea and I think it'll bring uh, wonderful progress. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Kia ora. Ka kite. Ka kite. Um, Committee members, the last two items um, are actually not substantial and can be left to the next meeting. Um, so the update of the emissions reduction plan, that can be brought to the next committee meeting uh, in a more substantial way. You'll have more information to share at that point. Yeah. So if, if everyone's okay with that so we can get you on the road and home sooner rather than later, um, we can um, end our, our meeting. Um, but can I please have a mover for eight and nine um, to receive those? Uh, Annette and uh, Zan, all those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Kia ora tato. <laughs> and just to finish us off, um, would someone like to uh, lead our closing karakia? Uh, matua uh, Mare, would you lead us in our closing karakia? Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, well, look... Um we give thanks to the many blessings that have enabled this very productive discussion to, um, for our climate change <coughs> um, committee at Rōpū um, and also just to acknowledge um, uh, the safe return back to your respective whānau, um, those of us that have got to stay at our office desk till five o'clock maybe and a little bit beyond. Um, but as my uncle Heitia would say, we stood our ladder up into the atua and now we're about to bring it down. So nō reira, kao Kau tātou katoa, te ātawhai o tō tātou ariki a ihu karaiti, me te arohao te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu a ke tonu atu. Amine. Amine. Kia ora, everybody. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.